I, I call to order the thematic discussion of the General Assembly entitled From Commitment to Implementation, 10 Years of the Responsibility to Protect. I'd like uh, to warmly welcome all of you to this meeting, a discussion that will provide us an opportunity to mark the beginning of the second decade of the Responsibilities to Protect and to consider 
how it can best contribute to future efforts to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Since the establishment of the United Nations uh, 70 years ago, perhaps our greatest failure has been the inability to always protect civilians against atrocity crimes. The images of those atrocities, the terror and pain felt, felt by the vulnerable populations are embedded in the minds of citizens around the world. Today, we mark the 10th anniversary of a moment when our leaders said enough was enough. When we embraced the individual and shared responsibility to protect populations. The protection of populations, in my view, constitutes one of the main challenges facing our world and the United Nations today. I've convened this meeting, therefore, so that we can engage in a frank discussion on this issue and reflect on the progress made to date, on the current and emerging challenges and opportunities to accelerate implementation of the global, regional, and national levels. Over the last 10 years, the results have been mixed. Regrettably, we continue to see atrocities happen on our watch, including those taking place in the ongoing crisis and conflicts of today. At the same time, atrocities have been averted, and the Secretary General has set out a framework for implementing this solemn commitment based on the three mutually reinforcing pillars. The responsibility of each individual state to lay the foundations for the protection of populations from these crimes and violations is captured in pillar number one. This focus on prevention and resilience building requires long-term and sustained commitment as well as targeted policies and actions. It entails building societies based on inclusiveness, transparency and accountability, building government institutions based on the rule of law and with full respect for human rights, and it includes developing appropriate early warning systems in order to adequately respond to potential threats. While we already have a well-tried comprehensive toolbox at our disposal for Pillar 1, we must continue to deepen our understanding of which measures can be the most effective. Pillars 2 and 3 look at our collective responsibility for the protection of populations outside our own borders from these crimes and violations. Pillar 2, therefore, requires that we assist and encourage our partners. This is not, not just an abstract consideration. Member states can encourage and support each other by building systems of resilience, including through capacity building assistance, and by engaging directly to support states that are dealing with periods of crisis. Pillar three is equally important. It requires that we consider all tools at our disposal and deploy those that will be most effective in preventing these grave crimes and violations, uh, always in accordance with the United Nations Charter. Experience demonstrates that timely and decisive response remains essential for protecting populations. It is also clear that an early collective response can dampen the determination of potential perpetrators to commit atrocity crimes. We also know that the choice here is not between inaction and the use of force. Non-military tools have made tangible difference in responding to the commission of atrocity crimes and preventing their escalation. This includes tools such as mediation, preventive diplomacy, fact-finding missions, special envoys and rapporteurs, referrals to the ICC and targeted sanctions, as well as an action by the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. We must continue to sharpen these tools and work to better understand their impact. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity 
have wide-ranging costs and long-lasting effects. The case for accelerating implementation of the responsibility to protect could not be stronger, and the returns on investment in prevention could not be higher, saving lives, of course, avoiding conflicts, advancing, advancing social cohesion and momentum around the sustainable development processes. In his most recent report on the responsibility to protect, the Secretary General encouraged us to consider a number of priorities for the decade ahead. Moreover, as we start this second decade of responsibility to protect, as we look at the challenges which the next Secretary General will face, we consider the incredible ambition behind the 2030 Agenda, and as we engaged in a major UN review process relating to peace and security, we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. Above all, we must ask ourselves what each of us, individually and collectively, will do to address the fundamental weaknesses in the international action that have allowed genocide, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity to occur also uh, over the last past decade. We have a distinguished panel today that can help us find answers to, to all these very important questions. I encourage you to engage them in an open discussion and to make the most of this opportunity so that we can advance our collective commitment to protect civilians from these grave international crimes and violations. I thank you for listening and I will now give the floor to the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Jan Eliasson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished uh, panelists and uh, participants. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Morgans, for convening this important meeting to mark the start of the second decade of the responsibility to protect. I'm glad to see so many friends and so many colleagues involved in and interested in the concept of R2P. I particularly want to salute former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans by, for his groundbreaking work to make R2P a norm and a political reality. I also warmly welcome Navi Pillai and Edward Luck, uh, like Gareth, close friends and great champions of human rights and R2P. You are in for a great panel discussion today. I regret that I, due to other duties, have to leave um, earlier than I wanted today. Ten years after the adoption of the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document, it's essential that we review what has been achieved and what remains to be done. Ten years ago, member states identified the need to bridge the gap between legal commitments to protect populations from genocide and crimes against humanity and the continuing failures of protection on the ground. As president of the General Assembly at the time, I well remember and recall those discussions. The solemn commitment that gave birth to the responsibility to protect was not designed to be a comfortable rhetorical restatement of common values. It was a call to move away from the status quo. It was a call to action. So, 10 years on, where do we stand? Have we moved from a commitment to delivery? Not much, I would say. Not sufficiently. Looking around the world, we see a number of situations in which populations are suffering horrendous abuses. Some of them may well constitute genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Individual states and the international community continue to fail in their responsibility to protect. Too often there is no responsibility. Too often there is no protection. The damage to societies, to future generations, and to the reputation of the United Nations and its values is far-reaching and long-lasting. We know all of this too well, and we have known it far too long. Let me talk plainly. <clears throat> I am appalled at the alarming disregard for international human rights and humanitarian law that we are seeing in this second decade of the 21st century. Impunity is pervasive, accountability is distant, too many member states are failing to live up to fundamental rules of international humanitarian and human rights law. And too many have yet to become parties 
to the international conventions which set out the framework for preventing and punishing the crimes identified by the principle of the responsibility to protect. Now, despite this somber introduction, I admit, <clears throat> I want to register some progress. The responsibility to protect has helped to generate a growing political understanding among member states on how to prevent and respond to atrocity crimes. Through successive General Assembly dialogues since 2009, Member States have agreed that prevention is at the core of the UN agenda. Our international action should employ the full range of diplomatic, political and humanitarian measures. Such action must take place in accordance with the United Nations Charter, and you heard the President refer to the Charter, both in its uh, preambular part, I suppose, and the first chapter, and uh, the wonderful Chapter 6, I su suggest for continued reading, particularly Article 33 and 34. Now, discussions on the responsibility to protect in other United Nations intergovernmental fora have replicated these points. The conceptual, political, and institutional development of the R2P constitutes constant work in progress. The responsibility to protect has also led to the development of new political commitments and new institutional capacities. We see, in other, we see it in other international and regional organizations, we also see it in international networks for the prevention of atrocity crimes. And let, let me list some of them because it is pretty impressive. The Global R2P Focal Point Network, the Regional Committee at the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region, the Latin American Network on Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, and the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes. All are actively enhancing our understanding of risk factors and sources of national resilience so that we start a culture of reacting at the early signs rather than waiting for the atrocities to occur. They all aim to prevent a downward spiral towards systematic violence. They help identify ways to assist states to better protect their populations. The measure of our success, of course, is the extent to which we have been able to prevent atrocity crimes or the escalation of such crimes. The last decade has seen mixed results. <clears throat> Developments in Cote d'Ivoire, um, Guinea, and Kenya count as successes. But our collective response to the Syrian crisis has been a catastrophic failure. A catastrophic failure. And the situation in South Sudan is deeply troubling. Other crisis areas are still the subject of debate. Measuring the impact of preventive action is difficult. Did you ever see a headline in the media, the disaster did not occur? Prevention is not rewarded to the extent that it should. <clears throat> Special advisors at Ahmad Yang and Jennifer Welch, my dear friends and colleagues, are launching a research project this year, which is to draw conclusions about the combination of tools likely to make the most difference in protecting populations at risk. The results of this research, based on a number of case studies, can guide, guide us in developing and employing the different instruments we have at our disposal. Let me here commend and thank Adama and Jennifer for their close and effective cooperation and for their excellent contribution to our work. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I see three priorities for building on what we have achieved. First, we must do better at prevention. That means a genuine and wider political commitment to early action from all sides. We must act early instead of waiting for disaster to occur. Internally, within the UN system, our Human Rights Upfront initiative is, I would say, an important step in this direction. But it is crucial that our alerts and our warnings land on fertile ground. Second, when crimes against humanity occur, we need to respond faster and more decisively. The evidence that we are not doing enough is painfully clear. It should spur us all to do more. In the light of self-interest of all concerned, we want to, this initiative is based on cooperation, on transparency, and dialogue. There is a common interest in avoiding the situation in which we find ourselves so much now in the UN now, where disasters are occurring, huge humanitarian operations are launched, peacekeeping operations are launched, while, while we know that we should at least try even harder at the preventive stage. And I would also add, by the way, we should be better at doing post-conflict work. 
the peace building commission work going on right now is meant to really make that instrument sharper. Third, we should do more, and I, I already mentioned it, we should do more in peace building, financially and politically. When rebuilding is not done, or when rebuilding fails, the risk of recurrence grows, and gains, as we have seen, can be quickly and tragically reversed. Just look at South Sudan right now. In such cases, we must maintain our engagement and learn from our past failures. Dear uh, participants, the Secretary General has spoken of the need to instill a culture of courage to ensure that respect for human rights and international humanitarian law does not succumb to other considerations. At the beginning of the second decade of the responsibility to protect, it is imperative that the international community unequivocally reaffirms the responsibility to protect of 2005. We must work collectively to make the protection from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity a living reality for millions of people to need to hear that reaffirmation. This is an obligation to humanity and to the people we are to serve in the spirit of the Charter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Deputy Secretary General. As you will be informed, we will shortly begin the panel discussion. The panel will be moderated by the Special Advisor of the Secretary General on Prevention and Genocide, Mr. Adama Jiang, and it will take place immediately following this opening segment in uh, this chamber. I would like to invite the moderator and the panelists of the interactive panel discussion to take their seats up here at the podium. The opening segment is now concluded. Thank you. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais tout d'abord dire tout le plaisir que j'ai à modérer ce débat pour marquer le dixième anniversaire de l'adoption du principe de la responsabilité de protéger. Je crois que les interventions aussi bien du président de l'Assemblée générale que celles du vice-secrétaire général démontre s'il en était besoin qu'aujourd'hui plus que jamais nous avons le devoir de nous mobiliser pour traduire dans les faits, dans la réalité, le principe de la responsabilité de protéger. Ce n'était pas un hasard si en 2005 les leaders du monde entier réunis ici à New York ont adopté ce principe. C'est parce que, tout simplement, ces leaders et les peuples du monde entier avaient été émus par les tragédies qui se sont succédées dans cette deuxième moitié du siècle, du XXe siècle. Et je veux faire référence notamment à ce qui s'est passé au Rwanda en 1994, avec le génocide des Tutsis, au cours duquel 
des Hutus, toi et autres modérés qui étaient opposés à ce génocide furent également tués. Je veux faire également référence au génocide de Srebrenica. Et le monde s'est écrié, après l'avoir fait en 1945, plus jamais ça. Mais hélas, nous sommes encore les témoins de la commission d'atrocités criminelles et cela est inacceptable. Et c'est pourquoi je suis heureux aujourd'hui d'avoir autour de moi ceux-là même qui ont été les pionniers. Et je veux d'abord faire référence à mon voisin de droite, Gareth Evans. Gareth, comme vous le savez, peut être considéré comme le père du principe de la Artupi, ayant présidé, comme vous le savez, la commission qui a élaboré le principe d'abord sous forme de, 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 de l'intervention et qui est passé euh, après débat euh, par, au, au sein des leaders euh, sous la forme de responsabilité de protéger. Nous avons également autour de cette table Navi Pilé, Navi euh, qui restera dans l'histoire comme ce juge qui, à Arusha, aura relevé que le viol commis dans certaines circonstances était assimilable au crime de génocide. Je vais faire état du jugement de Akayesu, mais j'aurai également, et je dois en parler, du jugement des médias, lorsqu'elle a su montrer que les mots peuvent tuer autant que les balles, faisant référence aux médias des, de la radio des mille collines, les médias de la haine. J'en parle parce qu'aujourd'hui, hélas, nous sommes les témoins d'un nouveau discours, un discours antisémite, un discours islamophobe, et nous devons nous mobiliser contre ce type de discours de haine. Et enfin, j'ai celui qui a été le premier conseil spécial pour la responsabilité de protéger Etlac, qui a entamé le travail de conceptualisation du principe de la responsabilité de protéger, et avec moi, Jennifer Welch, qui l'a succédé et qui a fait avancer cette conceptualisation. Et je puis dire qu'aujourd'hui, nous sommes pratiquement au bout de ce travail de conceptualisation et qu'il nous faut essentiellement nous tourner vers l'opérationnalisation de ce principe. C'est-à-dire que ce principe ne soit plus simplement qu'un jeu de mots, mais qu'il soit véritablement un principe pour l'action, pour la protection de nos populations. Et sans plus tarder, je vais très rapidement vous indiquer les règles qui vont conduire cette modération. Chacun des panélistes aura dix minutes pour faire son introduction, à l'exception de Gareth Evans, qui, avec la permission de ses collègues et avec mon accord, aura un peu plus de 10 minutes, 12 minutes pour être précis. Aux autres États membres ici dans la salle et organisation de la société civile, vous aurez chacun deux minutes et ceux-là qui parleront au nom des groupes régionaux auront quatre, voire cinq minutes au maximum. Ceci dit, j'invite à présent mon cher ami Gareth Evans pour ses remarques. Gareth. Well, thank you, Special Advisor Bieng. Thanks to the President of the General Assembly. Thank you, Excellencies and colleagues, for giving me the honour and privilege of addressing you. Let me say immediately to this very practically minded group of working diplomats that R2P was designed for pragmatists, not purists. Those of us who were involved in its creation were not trying to create new international legal rules or to undermine old ones. We knew that in the real world, it was going to be very hard to get perfect results, to end mass atrocity crimes once and for all. But we wanted to do much, much better than we had as an international community in the 1990s and in the decades and indeed centuries before that. To at least create a world in which genocide, other crimes against humanity, major war crimes, were regarded as everybody's business, not nobody's business, whenever and wherever they occurred. 
Well, 15 years after my commission, 10 years after 2005, how well did we succeed? Looking at the present catastrophe in Syria, it would be very easy to be cynical and to say that nothing at all has changed for the better. But let me give you a more positive stock take, using as benchmarks the four big things that we wanted our 2P to be. A normative force capable of building a real north-south consensus for action, a catalyst for institutional change, a framework for effective preventive action, and a framework for effective reactive action when prevention fails. So benchmark one, R2P is a normative force. There has been continuing growth in acceptance of R2P as a principle in a way that would have been unimaginable for humanitarian intervention or the right to intervene concepts, which R2P has now almost completely and rightly displaced. Although all of us know that many states are still more comfortable with the first two pillars of R2P than they are with the third, and we know that there'll always be argument about the precise form that action should take in any particular case, it really is the case that there's no longer any serious dissent evident in relation to any of the elements of the 2005 resolution. And the best evidence for this does lie in the General Assembly's annual interactive debates, which have taken place since 2009, which have shown ever stronger and more clearly articulated support for the new norm. It's also been evident in the more than 40 resolutions referencing R2P that have now been passed by the Security Council. Interestingly, 35 of them after the divisions over Libya in 2011. Of course, words without action are not enough. But words do continue to matter enormously. And it's crucial to ensure that R2P principles are talked up by leaders everywhere and wherever possible, formally consolidated and reinforced. And in that context, another substantive resolution from the General Assembly, clearly reaffirming the core normative commitment that was made at the 2005 World Summit, is now overdue. And I very much hope that there will be warm support for the resolution shortly to come before the General Assembly, drafted by a strong cross-regional group. Benchmark two, R2P as an institutional catalyst. All the normative consolidation in the world won't be of much use if R2P is not capable of delivering protection in practice. And that means, for a start, the continuing evolution of institutional preparedness at the national, the regional, and the global level, particularly at the critical stages of early prevention and early response to warning signs of impending catastrophe. R2P has been a change agent here with both civilian response capability and military response capability under both pillars two and three, receiving much more organized attention. Of great importance also has been the move to establish focal points, designated high level officials whose day job it is to analyze atrocity risk and to mobilize appropriate responses. There are now, as you know, more than 50 national and intergovernmental members of the global network of R2P focal points convened by the Global Centre for R2P, which I have the honour to chair. But here, as elsewhere, more needs to be done, not least right here at UN headquarters, where the roles of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide and the unhappily still only part-time Special Advisor on R2P do need to be not only recognised but rationalised and strengthened. Benchmark three, R2P is a preventive framework. The credibility of the whole R2P enterprise has depended from the outset on giving central importance to prevention, as was emphasised by the Deputy SG. And here, especially in the context of post-crisis prevention of recurrence, R2P-driven strategies have had a number of notable successes, particularly Kenya, after 2008, the West African cases of Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire through the last decade, <coughs> Kyrgyzstan after 2010. Most peacekeeping operations now, as you know, have strong protection of civilian mandates built on R2P's sister concept of POC. And most of the time, these operations are succeeding in keeping the lids on some, on some often very simmering pots. 
There's also now, thanks particularly to the work of my panel colleagues, special advisors, former special advisor Ed Luck, Jennifer Welsh, the work they've done on successive SG's reports, there's a very good understanding by all of us of the large toolbox of preventive measures that are available at all stages of the conflict cycle. But the record of practical delivery has not been nearly as strong as our rhetoric. And it is the responsibility, again picking up a theme of Jan Eliasson, it is the responsibility of all of us to continue working to change a culture where fighting fires gets more attention, more respect than effective action to prevent them. Benchmark four, R2P as a reactive framework. This is where R2P really has to make a difference. When events are exploding, when people are dying, and the not so good news here, which we have to acknowledge, is that on this critical challenge of stopping mass atrocity crimes that are actually underway, whether through diplomatic persuasion or stronger measures like sanctions and criminal prosecutions or through military intervention, in all of these respects, R2P's record has been at best mixed. There have been some success stories. Kenya in 2008 again, Cote d'Ivoire, and at least initially, Libya in 2011. And some partial success can be claimed for new or revitalised UN peacekeeping operations in Congo, South Sudan and the Central African Republic. But there have also obviously been some serious failures, certainly including Sri Lanka, 2009, and in Sudan, where the original crisis in Darfur predates R2P's acceptance, but President al-Bashir remains unchecked and the situation continues to deteriorate. We're not doing as well as we should be in stopping non-state actors like Boko Haram committing atrocity crimes in territory over which they have control. And above all, there's been the catastrophic international paralysis over Syria. The crucial lapse in Syria occurred, occurred in mid-2011 when the Assad regime's violence was one-sided and containable. Driven by the perception, which I personally think accurate, that the Western powers had overreached in Libya by stretching a limited civilian protection mandate into a regime change crusade, a number of Security Council members then overreacted the other way. With no majority support for a resolution in the Security Council even to condemn, just to condemn the regime's violence against unarmed civilians, the situation in Syria rapidly deteriorated into the full-scale civil war raging today. I believe in this context that there's no more important or urgent task for R2P advocates than to pick up the pieces from what went wrong in Libya in 2011 and to rebuild consensus within the Security Council as to the right way to handle these hardest of cases. Re-establishing that consensus is not impossible, but it's going to take time. Brazil's responsibility while protecting RWP proposal remains the most constructive of all the suggested ways forward, requiring, as it would, council members to accept close monitoring and review of any coercive military mandate throughout such a mandate's lifetime. And I hope that proposal continues to be seriously debated. There are a number of other ways in which Security Council practice could be modified to enhance its responsibility when handling atrocity crime cases, which I also hope will be taken seriously by Council members and the larger UN membership. And that includes embracing the ACT Group's Code of Conduct and the French-Mexican Veto Restraint Initiatives, both of which are increasing, receive, receiving increasing support from the wider UN membership. So, Chairman, colleagues, complete, fully effective implementation of R2P of course remains some way off. But I see no evidence anywhere that anyone really wants a return to the bad old days when the whole UN was a consensus-free zone on mass atrocity crime issues. We should never forget just how bad those days were, could be. In November 1975, seven months after the Khmer Rouge had commenced its genocidal slaughter in Cambodia, then United States Secretary of State Henry Kissinger famously said to the then Thai Foreign Minister Chacha Chunavan, you should tell the Cambodians, by which he meant the Khmer Rouge, that we'll be friends with them, 
They're murderous thugs, but we won't let that stand in our way. Well, as cynical as our political leaders sometime remain, and as a long-time politician myself, I know a fair bit about that political culture. Diplomats, of course, are, are different. It's hard to imagine any political leader today feeling able to talk like that. And that is a measure of how far we've come with R2P. But it's also a reminder of just how far we can fall again if we don't strive with all our might to strengthen, consolidate the gains that we have made. To now allow R2P to fade away into irrelevance would be to make a mockery of everything the UN Charter stands for and would be to defile our common humanity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Merci beaucoup, Gareth. Merci surtout d'avoir respecté le timing. Et j'invite maintenant Navi Pile. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to join this panel to stress the importance of consolidating the efforts to, uh, for the sustained implementation of R2P. As has been stated, the R2P has three components. One, the notion of state sovereignty as a responsibility for the most basic tenets of international human rights law. It is first and foremost the responsibility of states to protect their own populations. At the same time, the leaders gathered at the World Summit recognized that when necessary, the international community should assist states in implementing this responsibility. And thirdly, where a state manifestly fails to protect its own population, then there is the responsibility to protect falling on the international community, which it must exercise within the norms and standards of the Charter of the United Nations. And as Gareth Evans just described, the, uh, the way the Libyan, uh, Libyan intervention was handled um, has caused some setback, not only for R2P, but for international criminal justice as well. Uh, during my retirement, I have had a great deal to do with young people in Africa. And this is their sentiment. They really oppose international criminal justice and R2P because of the selective manner in which it has been exercised in the past. And this is then the importance that there has to be adherence to the norms and standards of the Charter. It means that in all interventions, whether mandated or whether invited by the state, state concerned, or in counter-terrorism measures, international humanitarian law and international human rights law must be respected, and the presence of the United Nations on the ground must be respected. Military action that is reasonably foreseen to cause suffering of civilians disproportionate to any legitimate military objectives violates the principle of humanitarian law and the Geneva Convention, as well as the UN Charter and R2P. So R2P is not a major new concept or principle and involves no legal change as it is embedded within the existing international law order. And as we heard, R2P was born as a response to protecting against genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. It is also a response to patterns and practices of human rights violations that include enormous disparities and distribution in wealth, the chasm between the world's rich and poor, discrimination in all its aspects, poverty, hunger, environmental degradation, and endemic diseases, all socio-economic conditions that feed into and exacerbate armed conflict. And as the concept note indicates over the past 10 years, extensive consideration of R2P has occurred within UN forums, within regional bodies, and within states. And all of this has contributed to the development of a consensus on core aspects of the principle. Member states agree 
on the need to prioritize prevention, to utilize a full range of diplomatic, political, and humanitarian measures, to consider military force as a last resort, and to ensure that implementation of the R2P is in accordance with the United Nations Charter and other established principles of international law. So we have come a long way over 10 years in that there is now consensus over these principles. The last decade has also witnessed the development of new institutional capacity, and this was uh, listed for us by the Deputy Secretary General. They include global, regional, and sub-regional mechanisms dedicated to the prevention of atrocity crimes. 51 member states and the European Union have set up focal points for the implementation of the R2P. The idea of an international R2P was incorporated in the Constitutive Act of the African Union and its Peace and Security Council as long ago as 2002. The Council cooperates with the UN Security Council and works with African human rights and governance mechanisms to fulfill its mandate. The AU security system does lack effective preventive mechanisms for managing emerging conflicts, and it only established a standby force in 2015. But the African Union missions function in many countries, in Somalia, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and they are in the process of assisting in Burundi. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights has adopted a resolution on strengthening the responsibility to protect in Africa. So while we recognize the progress made, the complex and highly eruptive conflicts underway in many parts of the world do present grave challenges for protection. These crises hammer home the full cost of the failure of the international community to exert the R2P and prevent conflict. They combine massive bloodshed and devastation of infrastructure with acutely destabilizing transnational phenomena, including widespread displacement of populations and flow of refugees, spread of terrorism, the proliferation of weaponry, atrocity crimes, and degradation of natural resources. The regular reports of the staff of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, investigations by various commissions of inquiry, and the, the regular reports of civil society organizations and human rights defenders paint a sorry tale of where the responsibility lies. Based on these reports, the High Commission of Human Rights, Zaid Al-Rad Hussein, told the high-level event on implementing R2P in the Geneva context in November 2015, uh, and I agree with his statement. He said, states and non-state actors are deliberately and increasingly violating the most fundamental rules of international law and they are doing so with impunity. Over the past five years, many NGOs, let me cite Physicians for Human Rights, have documented a staggering rise in the deliberate bombing of non-military targets such as hospitals and clinics in Syria. They have condemned the use of indiscriminate weapons such as barrel bombs and chemical weapons that instill terror and cause egregious injuries. The destruction of health care infrastructure carries particularly wide-ranging and long-lasting consequences on the capacity of Syrians to survive. None of the crises in the world today erupted without warning. They built up over years and sometimes decades of human rights grievances, deficit or corrupt governance, and lack of independent judicial and accountability institutions, discrimination and exclusion, inequities in development, exploitation, and denial of economic and social rights. 
early detection systems such as the 51 special procedures experts of the Human Rights Council and systematic scrutiny by treaty bodies repeatedly alerted us to this shortfall. So although the specifics of each conflict could not necessarily be predicted, many of the human rights violations that were at their core were known. They could and should have been prevented. Having to react to past or ongoing atrocities implies that we have already failed to protect. So the most effective way to implement R2P lies in the prevention of violations and crimes before they escalate. It is at this uh, juncture that the international community should be most effective. The crimes and violations covered by R2P never happened without warning. And as uh, Adama Dieng, our moderator, mentioned, we came across this in the trials, the genocide trials, at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. I was moved by testimony of witnesses that hate speech was spread over the years like little drops of petrol that set the whole country on fire. We judges found on the facts that this message of genocide was, would not have spread across the country had it not been for the uh, radio RTLM. And yet civil society urged the United Nations again and again to stop this radio. So that would have been an act of prevention that could have saved 800,000 lives. Agenda 2030 on universal sustainable development offers new opportunities for reinforced delivery of the principles of peace and security, human rights and development. The call for integration across the 17 goals that rights be at the center of development, that no one is left behind is a commitment that global values be implemented universally. And so let me say we now have mechanisms that we did not have before, such as the Human Rights Council and its universal periodic review, the treaty bodies, the special procedures mechanisms, all of which uh, point to and demonstrate the steps that states are taking and can still take to strengthen human rights domestically and how these steps help reduce the risk of mass atrocities. The Human Rights Upfront Initiative of the Secretary General is another important step to enhance the UN's own capacity to act collectively to address mass atrocity crimes, including responding early and effectively to warning signs. It is a reminder of the responsibility of every leader and of the UN to uphold human rights and to resist impunity in a principled manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Navi. Ed Luck. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Special Advisor. Uh, it is a distinct honor to speak to this August body about the possible next steps in our common struggle to prevent atrocity crimes, and to realize the ambitious goals of the Responsibility to Protect. I must say that the passion, energy, and intellect of my fellow panelists have contributed immeasurably to this journey. It has been a pleasure to travel it with them. Much has already been said, so I will just flag five of the innovative elements of paragraphs 138 and 139 of the 2005 outcome document. First was the assertion that all populations have to be protected. In an era of divisive sectarian politics, governments need to be reminded that their protection responsibilities extend to all people on their territory, regardless of their legal status, citizenship, political leanings, or ethnicity. At the same time, armed groups must be held to the same standards in any territory that they control. Leaders, whether of states or non-state armed groups, must be held accountable. Second is the commitment to preventing the incitement of the four crimes, something to which Navi Pelagia spoke very eloquently. Too often overlooked, this provision forms an essential plank of an effective strategy for early warning, for preventing the targeting of vulnerable groups, 
and for curbing the recruitment and mobilization of individuals and groups to commit such horrendous crimes. Defeating violent extremism demands not only better messaging, but also more consistent respect for the human rights standards enshrined in our charter. Third, we need to resist the temptation to assume that when the outcome document refers to the responsibilities of the international community, it was referring to someone else. Collective responsibility depends on individual responsibility. We each must do our part. With the rise of violent extremism, everyone is vulnerable. No one can say, as many did a decade ago, that this was an African problem, or that R2P is fine, but it does not apply here. Likewise, if we are to get early warning, assessment, and prevention right, we will need to listen more closely to local civil society and to give the vulnerable a greater sense of agency. Where R2P has made a quiet difference, in places like Kenya, Kyrgyzstan, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire, regional and sub-regional actors were key players in shaping timely and effective responses. They must be more than just our silent partners. In several of these situations, early engagement under Chapter 6 and 8 of the Charter did not require prior approval by the Security Council. As the Secretary General has rightly stressed, our common strategy should be based on early and flexible response, tailored to the circumstances of each situation. No timely and decisive option, including targeted collective measures under Chapter 7 and Pillar 3, should be off the table when thousands of lives are at stake. Fourth, paragraph 139 speaks of assisting states under stress before crises and conflicts break out. That provision encouraged me to propose the second assistance pillar of the Secretary General's 2009 implementation strategy. Building on the sensible and wide-ranging recommendations in the Secretary General's 2014 R2P report, there is much that this assembly, as well as ECOSOC, the PBC, and the Human Rights Council, could do to help build the capacity of governments, civil society, and the private sector to make both the occurrence and the reoccurrence of atrocity crimes less likely. Since the best predictor of atrocities is past ones, we need to focus more energy and resources on our collective responsibility after protecting, RAP, if you may, on making sure that the institutions, legislation, and values are in place to discourage further rounds of violence. That has been a prime lesson from Libya. My fifth and final report, point relates directly to the work of this assembly. Unlike many advocates, I welcome the outcome documents call for the assembly to continue consideration of R2P. Seeing this as an opportunity to refine and strengthen the principle, as well as to enhance member state ownership of R2P, I suggested that we initiate an annual series of reports and informal dialogues on different aspects of the emerging norm. These cycles have more than met my expectations, and I commend the President of the General Assembly for convening today's session. But I must ask, why, after seven sets of reports and, international and interactive dialogues, as, where, as well as eight years of applying R2P in specific situations, has this Assembly failed to pass a substantive R2P resolution or to provide funding for the Special Advisor and this critical work. What questions about the nature of R2P could possibly remain unanswered? For all of the supportive words, this is one deed that remains undone. In closing, let me thank the President and Special Advisor Adama Dieng for this opportunity. I look forward to this dialogue and, as so often in the past, to learning from the member states.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. I will give you the medal for time management. You did it in six minutes. Bravo. Now the floor is to Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ambassadors, excellencies, fellow panelists, and ladies and gentlemen. As the special advisor to this Secretary General, who has shown steadfast commitment to the development and implementation of the responsibility to protect, it's a great pleasure and honor to address this event convened by the President of the General Assembly. My fellow panelists have had long and distinguished careers dedicated to international public service and to addressing situations that involve the <coughs> gravest violations of human rights. And their presentations reflect that wisdom and that normative commitment. Paragraphs 138 and 139 of the 2005 Summit Outcome Document, which affirm a political commitment to protecting populations from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing, were designed to be more than diplomatic words or an expression of the lowest common denominator. With the failures of collective action represented by both Rwanda and Srebrenica in the backdrop, they aspired to something more, to reducing the gap between existing legal responsibilities of states, which are clearly evident in black and white in international humanitarian and human rights law, and the reality of populations threatened with large scale and systematic violence. Indeed, that is what normative commitments are designed to do. Aspiration is at their very core. Yet experience also demonstrates that the normative ideas that have the greatest impact are those that do not stray too far from what member states collectively believe is legitimate. And so with the more controversial case of the Kosovo War also in their minds, the diplomats and political leaders present at the World Summit hammered out a version of the responsibility to protect that would honor the letter and spirit of the UN Charter and serve as an ally rather than an adversary of sovereignty. And 10 years on, I think their formulation displays great wisdom. But a decade on, any evaluation of the responsibility to protect needs to assess its progress, not just in terms of how close we are to meeting the aspiration, a world where these acts are prevented or minimized, but also in terms of how it has changed expectations. And moreover, that assessment should take place in relation to other normative efforts of the same ilk. The principle of responsibility to protect is still in the relatively early stages of what is a long and uneven journey. Some commentators seem to hold the responsibility to protect to an impossibly demanding standard in terms of both what it should have achieved and by when. And when reflecting today, we are confronted with the obvious fact that atrocity crimes remain a, a feature of the 21st century landscape. In fact, in the last two years alone, acts that may constitute genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity occurred in the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Democratic Republic of North Korea, Iraq, Libya, Nigeria, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. This is a long list. The majority of these acts have been perpetrated by governments or by factions supported by governments. But the overall sense of crisis now confronted by the international community is heightened by the emergence of violent extremists who brazenly flout international humanitarian law and glorify their crimes. Taken together, these situations have created protection challenges of a monumental scale, which you in this chamber are all too well aware. When we turn to the specific armed conflicts on our landscape, there is, as the Deputy Secretary General highlighted, an alarming decline in respect for international humanitarian and human rights law on the parts of states that have ratified relevant legal instruments, often in situations where national authorities argue that exceptional security threats or political crises justify abrogation from these legal obligations. The scale of civilian harm today, ladies and gentlemen, is not the tragic but inevitable consequence of what happens in the fog of war, but rather the result of conscious choices made by warring sides. And we should be clear about what the consequences of this are. 
Navi Pillay admirably laid out the human and economic cost, but we also need to remember the effect on our normative and legal landscape and a culture of restraint which has been pa painstakingly built up. Now, as you can tell from the emotion in my own voice, it would be tempting to view these trends as proof of R2P's failure. But to do so is to blame the principal rather than those who are charged with upholding it. The responsibility to protect cannot on its own compel states to act. No political principle can do that. Nor can it dictate what specific actions the international community should take in any particular case. States and other actors need to choose from a variety of mechanisms, which responsibility to protect in part has been helpful in clarifying over the last decade. But what the principle can do is create political pressure around situations involving atrocity crimes and raise the political costs of inaction. It can also clarify existing obligations and provide a practical policy framework for states to implement effective measures for prevention and response. On these measures, as my fellow panelists have stated, the responsibility to protect has had significant impact. And the dark landscape I painted a few moments ago suggests that its relevance is as strong as it was a decade ago. The principle has helped to create a category of acts that are, by their very nature, issues of international concern by establishing a floor of decency beyond which states themselves agree that populations should not fall. This has changed and elevated expectations about what should occur when populations fall below that threshold and galvanized an array of efforts, including research and policy development, to prevent the descent into systematic violence. This is worth celebrating today. We simply know more than we did a decade ago about why some states descend into atrocity crime situations while others do not. This progress is often obscured by a singular focus on the issue of the use of force. To evaluate responsibilities to protect success in terms of whether we see a consistent pattern of military intervention is to demand too little and too much. Too little because there are many other tools and mechanisms that can be brought to bear to address situations featuring atrocity crimes. Assessing how the international community has responded to date and how it could respond in future requires analysis of these non-military means and the conditions under which they are effective. And too little because, like all issue areas that touch on the use of coercive means, implementation of responsibility to protect is profoundly shaped by the dynamics within and unique structure of the UN Security Council. The intense debates we have seen in this chamber during successive interactive dialogues have brought into sharp relief why responsibility to protect was and will remain a demanding principle. It challenges states to make concrete decisions domestically, to enhance their ability to engage in risk assessments, to invest in the inhibitors to atrocity crimes, and to improve their ability to assist other states under stress. These imply real resources and real policy attention. But that is what is implied by the responsibility to protect. The principle also challenges us at the international level to honestly assess the barriers to collective action, which are not, by the way, unique to the responsibility to protect but which are laid bare in cases where atrocity crimes have been committed or imminent. But we must do more than identify the reasons for why collective action is not always mobilized. We must work tirelessly to address or minimize those factors, whether through changes to working methods, improvements in our diplomatic toolbox, more focused and sustained political leadership, or financial support for the mechanisms that have worked and can work. This too is our shared responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, we should not shy away from a principle because it is demanding. Instead, we should creatively explore how we can do better. That is what all of us on this panel have tried to do and which many of you in this chamber have tried to do. As Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has noted, responsibility to protect offers an alternative to indifference and fatalism. 
It constitutes a milestone in transforming international concern about people facing mortal danger into meaningful response. The challenges of atrocity crimes may indeed be daunting and the human cost staggering, but we cannot lapse into thinking that the means to prevent or halt them are beyond, are beyond our reach. The past decade of the development of responsibility to protect has shown us that this is not the case. The next decade must build on these concrete advances to deliver more effective protection for all populations. I thank you for your attention, and I very much look forward uh, to your comments. I will be listening very carefully to, uh, to your thoughts and recommendations. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, let me just turn to uh, Garrett and ask you, uh, what do you see as the, um, the respective role of the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council uh, in advancing R2P? Well, that's a very big Response, a great number of things that need to be done at each level, and both arms of the UN system are extremely important. So far as the General Assembly is concerned, I think you've heard what the agenda it is. It's to get approved, resolved, a substantive resolution consolidating the norm and also moving from there to give appropriate institutional and financial support to the Office of the Special Advisors. I'm not sure how many of you are aware that um, Jennifer Welsh is still operating on a $1 a year uh, basis as a completely part-time uh, honorary participant in this enterprise. This is too important an institution to be treated this way, and the Assembly has a crucial role in fixing that. So far as the Security Council is concerned, apart from all the obvious specific individual cases which need the Council's attention, there's a great deal that the Council itself can do to consolidate and institutionalise the norm use R2P language even more often than the Council has been doing and not just confined to a Pillar 1 context. Have more regularised briefings by the Special Advisors and consider establishing a permanent Security Council working group on R2P. Encourage, um, we should encourage the Council to have a specific formal meeting this year to discuss R2P in general terms and perhaps pass a general resolution of its own, building on the resolution commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. There should be, as I said in my remarks, active support for the ACT groups, Code of Conduct and the French-Mexican veto initiatives, as difficult and as substantial as they are. There needs to be uh, pressure from the Security Council, indeed the membership generally, to ensure that the next Secretary General is someone who takes R2P as seriously as both Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon to their great credit, have done. But above all, the role of the Security Council and the need for the Security Council is, as I said again in my remarks, to focus squarely on what went wrong in Libya in 2011, the lingering sore of that, and to try to provide a basis for consensus in the future when these hardest of cases come along that may indeed require military action. And here, I think it is very important that the P3 members of the Security Council acknowledge that whatever their good intentions, things did go wrong in 2011. The sore, the, the wound from that still lingers, the perception that there will be overreach if a military mandate is ever granted. And it's very important to moderate that by the Security Council accepting something like the responsibility while protecting proposals. There's a big agenda out there, and I think it's very important that all parts of the UN system, and in particular the two key agencies, the General Assembly and the Security Council, recognise that they have responsibilities not just to move along the appropriate response to individual cases, but to really consolidate this norm and to create an environment, finally, as Jennifer said, where we raise the political cost of countries ignoring R2P principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Garrett. Uh, Navi, uh, could you tell us, uh, having been based in Geneva and also in New York, uh, how we can get closer uh, the uh, New York and Geneva, uh, particularly on human rights, peace, and security. Uh, thank you, Adama. Uh, my predecessor, Louise Arbour, was asked to walk out of the Security Council. She was told this is no place for human rights. And I welcome the change that I was able to address the Security Council on human rights issues and violations. 
uh, which informed them on the actions and resolutions that they were passing and that I had uh, addressed them all, more than 15 times. So I do sense uh, this tendency to see human rights as being down far away in Geneva and that peace and security are matters to be dealt here. So I see the need for narrowing the divide in, uh, in a comprehensive understanding and institu institutionalization of R2P. The important reality is that if one is having a debate about Pillar 3 at all, it is because Pillars 1 and 2 have failed. All right, so these institutions uh, currently rely on the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights because that's the one office that works in very close cooperation with civil society organizations. They are in possession of valuable information uh, about violations on the ground. So states need to have this information as they determine their policies and uh, actions. Uh, and so what I ask for is a broadening of the democratic space. I'm really concerned that more and more countries are moving in the opposite direction, and that is restricting NGO activity. They are a source of vital information, and they could keep governments in touch with what's happening on the ground. So thank you, Adam, and that's what I would say. Thank you very much, uh, Nevi. Uh, Ed, you did say that uh, we all have a responsibility uh, to protect, but could you elaborate and tell us uh, how about the, this notion of uh, uh, individual R2P? Uh, thank you very much, Adama. This is probably the wrong place to say it as I look out at all these representatives of member states. But I think in some ways the initial conception of R2P was too state-centric. Uh, one of my work at the UN, uh, it just occurred to me that again and again, where we're able to make a difference, it's because there are individuals who are persuadable, individuals who are going to make choices. And the question was to make sure they understood the consequences of those choices for themselves in terms of accountability uh, and for their societies in terms of economic and political and cultural development. And I think in many ways the bottom line with R2P is to convince people to think about these things in a way that perhaps they hadn't before. And I think several people in different ways have already referred to this uh, this morning, uh, but there are lots of people who matter, including those who are vulnerable. And we should be listening to them. Uh, we should be giving them a sense that they do have some agency. Uh, we should be thinking of ways to be of assistance to them, uh, which have nothing to do with sovereignty and nothing to do uh, with the things that we like to debate here, but people protecting people. These crimes are not committed by abstractions. They're committed by people. And they're committed because people make the wrong choices. And it's not only that leaders make choices, but some people decide to participate. And some people decide to be bystanders. Some people try not to hear incitement or hate speech or the targeting of groups. So it seems to me the individual responsibility is simply a subset of understanding how the responsibility to protect actually works. It works about people talking to people and trying to convince them to take a different stance and to take a different path. So to me, it's really not so much an academic uh, uh, discovery, but just from practice, uh, five, six years of working on these things here, again and again, where we did make a difference, it's because there were governments that were not 100% committed uh, to this course of action, where there were people who were willing to listen, uh, where there were regional leaders who would take an important stance in trying to be persuasive, and that we ought to think of responsibility to protect not as some big argument among states about theory, but the actual practice of the way some people treat other people. So thank you. Uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, could you tell us at what level do you think implementation efforts should be focused? Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, we have been debating at a very conceptual level uh, and diplomatic level, and as Ed Luck just mentioned, 
in many ways, it's encouraging that change at the individual level that's critical. But I also think when we look ahead 10 years, um, it is very much at the national level, both in, both in terms of those policy choices that I hinted at in terms of being able to conduct risk assessments, build up the inhibitors to these four, four acts, reallocate resources uh, in order to do that, but also reassess how it is that different states try to assist one another, uh, particularly when a state is under stress. How we are using development cooperation dollars, peace building dollars, for example, really re-examining that at the national level. And I actually think legislators and parliamentarians have a big role to play here. And then in the next decade, discussions at that level will be in, important for implementation. But I also think, and this is something I didn't mention in my remarks, that going further, for, uh, forward, we also need to think a little bit more about the means uh, to commit these acts. And I'm not just talking about the familiar terrain, although very problematic, of military means and small arms and light weapons and, and other weapons, uh, but also the financial means, and as Ed Luck was hinting at, uh, the political means, how it is that particular groups are able to galvanize uh, an exclusionary ideology and use it, which provides them with the capacity to convince others to commit these kinds of acts. So I think more focused attention on the means going forward uh, is also critical. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite the uh, representative of the European Union to speak on behalf of the European Union. Thank you very much and, and we would like to thank the President of the General Assembly for convening this meeting and the panelists for their presentations. Uh, I would like to add that the candidate countries Turkey, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Albania as well as Georgia align themselves with this statement. The European Union is a strong supporter of the responsibility to protect and its three reinforcing pillars. This has been reflected in our priorities for the General Assembly since 2005. We are committed to implement this important principle through better use of the full range of our diplomatic, political, development, human rights and humanitarian instruments and our partnerships around the globe. Uh, following the insightful presentations, we would like to make three comments. Firstly, on the fact that too many atrocities are still being perpetrated in far too many places. It sounds obvious, but the prevention and halting of atrocity crimes need to become a real overarching political priority. Mustering political will and acting accordingly is our joint responsibility in the face of ongoing horrors as in Syria. In this context, we are supportive of the cross-regional initiative aiming at the adoption of a substantive resolution to mark the 10th anniversary of Member States' commitment to responsibility to protect. We particularly value the proposal to include the implementation of R2P in the formal agenda of the General Assembly, allowing for a much welcome discussion on this issue. We also welcome the Code of Conduct of the Accountability, Coherence and Transparency Group and the work of France and Mexico regarding Security Council action to prevent or end mass atrocities. Secondly, Alongside capacity building, we want to emphasize the important aspect of prevention. As part of the responsibility to protect, there's an obligation to do all we can to prevent crisis from occurring. Prevention is the most cost-effective way to save lives. Our efforts must be focused on identifying the early signs that could lead to the worsening of a particular situation. The development of better early warning capabilities, such as the framework of analysis on atrocity crimes, can help anticipate risks of potential atrocities and mobilize resources to respond preventively. The EU conflict early warning system has been on the forefront in including the risk of atrocity crimes from the beginning, but more could be done. International and regional human rights mechanisms are also crucial elements in the operationalization of responsibility to protect. In this context, we reiterate our continued support for the Secretary General's initiative, Human Rights Up Front, as well as for the UN Special Advisors on the Prevention of Genocide and on the Responsibility to Protect, as well as other international and regional actors and civil society organizations engaged in preventive action. Finally, 
We wish to stress the importance of mainstreaming R2P and ensuring coherence with other processes. UN peacekeeping operations and peacebuilding activities have a critical role to play in assisting the host states in the implementation of R2P. This needs to be fully acknowledged in the ongoing review of the UN peace operations. Furthermore, we should also ensure coherence with the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, which is tying peace, security, development and human rights together most prominently in the Sustainable Development Goal 16 on peaceful and inclusive societies. I thank you very much. I thank the representative of the European Union and now give the floor to uh, the representative of the Group of Friends of R2P, His Excellency uh, the Ambassador of Rwanda. Thank you, uh, moderator and dear panelists. I have the honor of delivering uh, this statement on behalf of other 50 members of the group of friends of the R2P co-chaired by the Kingdom of the Netherlands and uh, uh, the Republic of Rwanda. A longer uh, version of this uh, statement has been distributed to the chamber. Uh, the group of friends thanks the President of the General Assembly uh, for convening this uh, important event to mark the beginning of the second decade of uh, the responsibility to protect. The group of friends reaffirm its enduring commitment to paragraphs 138 and 139 of the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document on the Responsibility to Protect. Paragraph 139 of the 2005 World Summit Outcome uh, document stress the need for the General Assembly to continue consideration of R2P in this regard. The group of friends welcomes the draft uh, UN uh, General Assembly resolution on uh, the responsibility to protect circulated by uh, Australia, Botswana, or Brazil, Denmark, Ghana, Guatemala, the Republic of Korea, and Slovenia. We thank the members of, the, of this truly cross-regional group for uh, their effort and welcome its effort to work uh, toward a balanced text which emphasizes the importance of prevention and the interconnection between R2P, peace building and the broader human rights and civilian protection agendas. We also welcome the strong support of the special advisors on the prevention of genocide and on uh, the responsibility to protect, to contribute uh, this uh, to this interactive dialogue, the group of friends uh, would like to pose uh, three uh, questions uh, for the esteemed panelists on accelerating the implementation of R2P. How, first, how can uh, the UN and its member states increase political support and political will to implement the responsibility to protect? Two, in terms uh, of national capacities, uh, what are some of the most effective measures uh, member states can take to strengthen their own resiliency to mass atrocity crimes, and what regional of, or international support might best support this. Uh, third and last, regarding protecting civilians, 10 out of uh, 16 UN peace operations currently have uh, these uh, functions at the core of their mandates. How can the United Nations tangibly strengthen uh, the protection of civilians, particularly from atrocity crimes like those under the R2P framework in the context of these operations. Uh, I thank you uh, once again. I thank the President of the General Assembly and uh, thank the esteemed panelists uh, for their contributions to advancing the responsibility to protect on behalf of our group. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if you allow me on national capacities, I have just one question, uh, if it's possible. Uh, it won't take uh, m more than one minute. So uh, I should just ask uh, maybe Professor Gareth and also the panelists. Uh, it's kind of a thought-provoking question in light of what is happening in Burundi. We all really know what is happening there. We have seen uh, various statements of the council and other interested parties, including the AU and other member states. We have seen various reports, some of them with a particular narrative that have nothing to do with the prevention of mass atrocities. Uh, yet innocent civilians uh, continue to pay the ultimate price. As my president, uh, President Kagame, recently uh, put it, I quote, uh, as usual, when the toll will be finally counted, 
and found to be too high. And and national capacities. Please, this is very important. We are talking about R2P. We have really to talk about this. I didn't hear anybody here talking about it. And if we want really to go further and to try to protect people, please let me finish this quote and then we continue. Is that okay, President, Mr. Moderator? Oh, thank you. Say that, or let me quote what the President, President Kagame said. He said that, stated that as usual, when the toll will be finally counted and found to be too high, and questions asked about responsibility to protect, simple answer, he said, we did not know, read, we did not want to know. The argument, we go on and on, and life we continue to be lost. Instead of never again, we have yet, uh, yet again. I would really uh, welcome your views, uh, dear panelists, uh, on this particular issue. As someone who contributed also a lot in putting together uh, the concept of R2P, I'm sure uh, this might really be a difficult question, but it will help my understanding, our understanding, to see how we can protect the people in Burundi. And I stated this uh, in my own national capacities. I'm so sorry that I used this time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you to the groups of Friends of R2P for their continuing support. And now I give the floor to the representative of Sudan. شكرا جزيلا السيد ادم ويسر النقاش ودعني اتقدم بالشكر لرئيس الجمعيه ونائب الامين العام والمتحدثين من من المنصه وابدا بالتعليق على مداخله الناشط ايفانس والتي اشار فيها الى فخامه رئيس جمهوريه بلادي السودان بطريقه غير لائقه وغير مقبوله ولعل الناشط قد نسي او تناسى انه ضيف على منبر الدول الاعضاء بالامم المتحده وعلى الضيف أن يتحلى ببعض اللياقة ويحترم من, من يستضيفه في, في بيته ولكن ربما الناشط إيفانس ما يزال يقرأ من كتاب الاستعمار الغربي القديم الذي زرع الفتن والمشاكل في أفريقيا ونهب مواردها وسرواتها ولذلك يتحدث باستعلاء من منصة المستعمر وكأنه يخاطب شعوب أفريقيا التي نسي التي التي نسي الناشط أنها قد تحررت ولن تقبل باستعمار جديد تحت مظلة مفاهيم تهدف إلى التدخل في شؤونها وتهديد سيادتها وحدتها الإقليمية وأمنها واستقرارها ونهب مواردها مرة أخرى ولعل هذه الإشارة تؤكد أن المفهوم نبيل من حيث الإطار ولكنه أداة جديدة للاستعمار كل الذين تحدثوا عبروا عن موقف واحد ولذلك فما نشهده نحن هو منالوج وليس ديالوج كان ينبغي أن يتم التعبير عن مواقف دول أخرى حول هذا المفهوم أي محاولة لتطبيق هذا المفهوم في ظل خلاف مفاهيمي لن تكون محاولة حكيمة ولذلك فمبادرة الدول بطرح مشروع قرار في ظل تباين مفاهيمي عميق ومتجذر لن تكون مفيدة ولكنها ستعمق بشكل أكبر التباين الذي يشهده المفهوم بين الدول الأعضاء ومرة أخرى أرجو أن نحترم منصة الأمم المتحدة ومن برها نحن نمثل دولنا ونمثل رؤسائنا وبالتالي ليس من اللياغة أن يأتي ضيوف ويسيء إلى الرؤساء وإلى الدول وأرجو من السيد ميسر النقاش وهو من أفريقيا أن يكون أيضا حريصا على هذه, على هذه النقطة لأن ما استمعنا إليه في تقديري هو وجهة نظر واحدة ومقطوعة موسيقية واحدة تفضل دول أن تستمع إليها ولكن هناك دول أخرى أيضا تود أن تستمع إلى مقطوعة موسيقية أخرى لأن المفهوم ما ذال حوله خلاف عميق ومتجذر ليس هناك خلاف حول الأهداف النبيلة في حماية المدنيين ولكن الخلاف حول تطبيق هذا المفهوم ولعله منذ العام 2009 كل الأحداث التي تمت ليست في صالح هذا المفهوم الأحداث التي تمت في دول كثيرة تؤكد 
أن هنالك دوائر تريد من هذا المفهوم أن تتحكم في الدول وفي الشعوب مرة مرة أخرى إنه الاستعمار الذي يخرج لسانه من من جديد ويريد أن يعبر عن نفسه بطريقة جديدة دعونا نتحاور وأركز على الحوار الديالوج وليس المونولوج ما شهدناه اليوم هو مونولوج شخص يتحدث إلى نفسه المنصة كلها تتحدث عن رؤية واحدة دون اعتبار اللي رؤى دول دول أخرى وشكرا السيد الميسر Well, I, I thank the representative of Sudan, but I think just uh, right now you have illustrated that this is indeed a dialogue and not a monologue. I think you have been given a chance to react to what uh, Gareth Evans has said. I was just reading from this, uh, the text what he said about Sudan, uh, where he said that uh, there has been also some serious failures, certainly including Sri Lanka in 2009, in Sudan, where the original crisis in Darfur predates R2P, but the situation continues to deteriorate, President Omar al-Bashir remains effectively untouched either by his International Criminal Court indictment or multiple Security Council resolution. I think this is factual. Uh, and I, I think regarding the untouched or whatever, there is a fact that there has been a referral of the ICC one can argue, I mean, I have my own position on, about, about that issue, but I, I think it is simply a matter of freedom of expression, and I would invite you uh, after this meeting to sit uh, with Garrett and have a discussion. And once again, thank you very much for your uh, continuing support uh, to the prevention of uh, atrocity crimes. And now I invite the Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of uh, Kyrgyzstan, Mrs. Diana Rakemelova. Ваше превосходительство, дамы и господа, позвольте прокомментировать вопрос, связанный с упоминанием Кыргызстана. Как представлено в концептуальной записке и ранее в докладе Генерального секретаря ООН по данному вопросу, что согласованные международные действия в Кыргызстане помогли предотвратить повторные случаи совершения особо тяжких преступлений, а именно геноцида, этнических чисток, преступления против человечности и военных преступлений. В этой связи от имени своего правительства хотела бы отметить следующее. Представленная в докладе и концептуальной записке информация носит искаженный характер и не соответствует действительности. За всю историю суверенного Кыргызстана не было ни одного случая, которые подпадали бы под определение вышеупомянутых тяжких преступлений. Во время событий 2010 года в нескольких районах произошел межэтнический конфликт. Я хочу повториться, этот конфликт произошел не во всей территории, а в нескольких районах, который не носил характер осознанного, запланированного или систематического нападения против гражданского населения не являлся следствием проведения государственной политики. Кыргызская республика самостоятельно, без помощи извне, не допустила эскалации насилия и гуманитарной катастрофы. Конфликт удалось локализовать и остановить в течение четырех дней исключительно силами правительства Кыргызстана, без иностранного вмешательства. Отчеты 10 национальных и международных комиссий свидетельствуют, что июньские события 2010 года в Кыргызстане ни в одном из документов не классифицировано как военные преступления, этнические чистки или преступления против человечности. Мы высоко оцениваем поступившую помощь в постконфликтном восстановлении и миростроительстве и выражаем благодарность всем тем, кто откликнулся на обращение о помощи в рамках чрезвычайного призыва ООН по Кыргызстану на двусторонней основе по постконфликтному э, мирному строительству. Кыргызская республика последовательно и не, неуклонно придерживается соблюдения прав человека, включая права этнических меньшинств, свидетельством, чему является избрание Кыргызстана Совет по правам человека в 2009 году и в 2015 годах. Устойчивое, стабильное и мирное развитие Кыргызстана в последние годы 
соблюдение со страной своих международных обязательств в сфере прав человека, прошедшие в октябре 2015 года парламентские выборы, полностью соответствующие демократическим стандартам, укрепление единства народа и гражданской идентичности свидетельствуют о полном отсутствии оснований и практики системной дискриминации в стране, тем более повторения конфликтов. В этой связи мы просили бы исключить любое упоминание о Кыргызстане по вопросу использования принципа responsibility to protect. В свою очередь, хотела бы отметить, что третий компонент принципа, как многие э, говорили эксперты, он не является общепризнанным и требует ратификации всех стран, поскольку в этом случае входит противоречие с общепризнанными принципами территориальной целостности и национального суверенитета, которые закреплены в Уставе Организации Объединенных Наций. Кроме того, я хотела бы сказать, что Could этот принцип... Conclude, madam, okay. И тем более я хотела бы сказать, что этот принцип пока не является идеальным рецептом от конфликтов, и тем более оправдывать попытки экстремистов разрушать государство. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Minister. Uh, allow me simply to say that uh, when a reference is made to Kyrgyzstan, it is in a positive manner. It is to show that the then Kyrgyz government has accepted transparency. And indeed, I, my office at that time received even a request from the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs. That is to say, when, you ref when there is such reference, one doesn't need to wait until the situation reached the level of atrocity crimes. And that is, where, that is why we all acclaim Kyrgyzstan for accepting the support. There has been numerous uh, mediation effort. There has been numerous uh, diplomatic uh, intervention which helped. And I think today we still of course, need to keep continuing monitoring a situation. That, that, that means we should make every effort that member states themselves build national architecture which will allow them to be able to monitor the situation inside their respective countries. And that's why I always applaud Tanzania, you know, where they show transparency at a time when there was tension among religious communities. And this was stopped. And so that, that is simply, I, I, I can understand sometimes, of course, sensitivities, but there was nothing negative on that regard. But if you take it like that, I do apologize on behalf of the international community of which you are part of. And now I give the floor to uh, Mexico. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Señor presidente, quisiera iniciar señalando la, de man, la satisfacción del gobierno de México por este espléndido panel. Eh, quisiera en, en, en concreto dar un saludo a la señora Pilay de parte del representante permanente de México, el embajador Gómez Camacho, que te, ha estado toda esta mañana, pero tengo que salir en este momento. Sin embargo, señor, eh, quisiera destacar eh, la satisfacción de México, sobre todo, y refiriéndonos a la intervención de, de Gareth Evans, la forma tan destacada en la que ha identificado los momentos en donde el tema de responsabilidad de proteger se, se ha presentado. Le agradecemos la referencia, sobre todo a la iniciativa franco-mexicana para poner límites al uso del veto en caso de delitos de lesa humanidad, genocidio, crímenes de guerra. Eh, creemos, señor, porque de eso se trata la iniciativa, que la, los P5, los miembros del Consejo, los cinco permanentes del Consejo de Seguridad, tienen en efecto una responsabilidad ante la comunidad internacional cuando paralizan el sistema de las Naciones Unidas y no permiten que haya una intervención conforme a la Carta. Es, de eso se trata fundamentalmente la, la iniciativa y el deseo de que esta responsabilidad, cuando se veta, podríamos mencionarla, eh, sea también bien dimensionada por la realidad, por la, la comunidad internacional y sobre todo por los países que tienen esta responsabilidad. Nos encontramos en la organización en un momento de reestructuración del pilar 
de paz y seguridad internacionales. Es muy, muy, eh, en muy buen momento eh, el que hecho que propongan el, el tema de la prevención y que también subrayen, como lo hiciera el profesor Locke, a quien también eh, queremos y admiramos en, en, en México, tiene mu mucha gente que lo estima, eh, la responsabilidad después de proteger. En efecto, creemos que la prevención, pero también la construcción de la paz, deben de ser dos elementos que en esta nueva arquitectura de paz y seguridad internacionales esté muy presente en la organización. Como hemos visto, señor presidente, el tema es un tema que levanta pasiones. Creemos que es muy importante y felicitamos al presidente de la Asamblea General por la organización de este debate. Es muy importante que tengamos una reflexión desapasionada en, en, en las Naciones Unidas, que veamos de una manera prudente cómo podemos fortalecer al sistema y cómo podemos tener una suma de esfuerzos de la manera más positiva para la organización. Por lo pronto, señor, felicidades por esta iniciativa y reconocemos el compromiso y el trabajo de un panel espléndido, inmejorable. Muchas gracias. I thank the representative of Mexico and I do give the floor now to the representative of the Russian Federation. Uh, to respect your time limit, I will have to speak in English. So, uh, apart from the uh, Jubilee of the World Summit Outcome document, which, uh, by the way, has already passed, we would like to remind about a more recent anniversary, and uh, it's about Libya. Five years ago, uh, it was bombed. And in 2011, many enthusiastically labeled these bombings as the first case of practical application of the R2P concept. Currently, however, these events are considered to be best forgotten. Not surprisingly, I haven't heard about Libya in the opening part of our today's session. Uh, use of force under the pretext of protection of civilians led to complete disintegration of the Libyan state, plunging the country into havoc and instability. And uh, such echoes of this tragedy as the migration crisis in the Mediterranean will linger for many years to come. That considered, we have not seen a single attempt at frank and comprehensive analysis of what happened in Libya, neither by the Secretariat nor by the member states. And the annual informal interactive dialogue on R2P has completely turned into the monologue of the supporters of this concept. And I say the monologue not because other views are not present, but because they are uh, listened but not heard. In such a situation, it would be difficult to discuss any development of R2P whatsoever, including in the uh, new substantive resolution of the GA, because uh, the fact that we have been unable to adopt such a resolution is quite telling that consensus is not there yet. And to finalize, I'm very great, grateful to the esteemed Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kyrgyzstan for important clarification, as I was indeed surprised to hear uh, the panel mention Kyrgyzstan as well as some other countries as the R2P success stories. It's a uh, distorted uh, information. Thank you. I thank the representative of Russia, but I beg to differ with you because indeed Libya was mentioned in previous statement made this morning. And uh, I do believe also if you have read the Secretary General report, Libya was also mentioned. And uh, as to the extent that the Secretary General uh, did uh, recommend that in the future, when such intervention take place, one has to look also the post-intervention because R2P, that, there is also the phase after. And that's in that regard that where when we talk even about the RWTP, uh, the responsibility while protecting, I used to say that this is an oxygen for the R2P. Because as a matter of fact, this is a reality. And, and I think one has simply to have the courage to sit around and to discuss. There is nothing perfect. I mean, this is human being. This is nothing perfect. And I think definitely uh, this, there has been lessons to be learned from, uh, from Libya. But should one simply throw the baby with the water of the bath because of one case, when you have other cases which have been successful, be it in Kenya, be it in Cote d'Ivoire, etc. So I, I think this is simply a matter of uh, we have to, 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 to bear in mind. Now I do invite the representative of uh, Slovenia. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, let me start by thanking the President of General Assembly for convening this important meeting and also all panelists uh, for a very insightful presentation for which we are very thankful. Uh, as a member of cross-regional uh, group of countries that prepared uh, this draft General Assembly resolution on R2P and which was formally presented yesterday, we received very mixed reactions. <laughs> We listened to everyone, and everyone was not only listened, but also heard. Slovenia calls, calls on all member states to actively engage in negotiations that will lead to strong and hopefully consensual adoption of a resolution, which will pay the way to better implementation of the concept uh, in the years to come. In our opinion, and many, many panelists have actually uh, expressed their position on that, uh, the key element of R2P is prevention. Uh, it's imperative for us to consolidate the efforts of the nation on the national, regional, and global level in order to protect populations against genocide, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, and ethnic uh, cleansing. Uh, we also believe that we have to better use available uh, preventive tools at our disposal. When I say available tools, I mean political, diplomatic, humanitarian, economic, legal, both in cooperative and coercive ways. Uh, no situation is identical, and uh, every situation requires tailor-made approach. Systematic human rights ed education, we believe, is an effective tool to promote respect to all human rights of all peoples, which is itself a very important element of prevention. True prevention can only happen uh, with the political will of countries involved. In this regard, we call on all current and future members of the Security Council not to block credible actions aimed at preventing the most heinous and atrocious crimes. Slovenia supports Act Code of Conduct regarding Security Council action against genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, and of course, we applaud a French and Mexican initiative on voluntary restraint of the use of the veto in mass atrocities situations. In this context, I would like to reiterate uh, Slovenia's strong support and continuous support for the Secretary General initiative, uh, human rights up front, as well as uh, support to special advisors for genocide and and R2P, uh, as well as, of course, civil society organizations engaged in prevention uh, action. Uh, to conclude, Mr. Moderator, Slovenia encourages also um, and invites all member states that have not yet become part to the international conventions, and especially uh, the Rome Statue of the ICC, uh, that set out the legal that set out the legal framework for the prevention and punishment of mass atrocity crimes to become party as soon as possible. This can give a very clear signal that mass atrocities are not acceptable and will not be tolerated and there, there will be no safe heaven anywhere for perpetrators of mass atrocities. I thank you, Mr. Moderator. Now I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the President of the General Assembly uh, for holding the discussion to mark this important uh, anniversary, the 10th uh, of the agreement on the responsibility to protect. And if I may, I, I want to thank you for the way that you are moderating the session and turning it into something much more interactive and therefore useful uh, than we are sometimes useful uh, than, than we are sometimes used to at the United Nations. Uh, the United Kingdom has been uh, a strong advocate uh, of the responsibility to protect uh, all uh, all along, uh, and are very proud uh, to recommit um, to uh, to that support uh, today. Uh, we very warmly welcome the strong role that each of our panelists ha has been playing in the implementation of R2P uh, and the role of so many member states. And I in particular welcome uh, the comments made by the European Union and the uh, friends of R2P. So we have this moment now where we can take stock uh, of how far we have come, reflect on the successes as well as the challenges, uh, and to look forward uh, to the next 10 years is a moment to think about how best to strengthen the mechanisms that we have at our disposal uh, to help prevent uh, and respond uh, to mass atrocities uh, when they cont continue to occur. 
the UK will continue to play our part. Uh, we've recently agreed a new strategic security and defense review, which amongst other things uh, puts the responsibility to protect uh, at the center of what we are doing and continuing to drive uh, for global improvements. We will strengthen our own approach to the prevention of mass atrocities. We'll work to improve our analysis of risk situations, and we will continue to encourage greater and more effective international coordination uh, in situations that relate to potential or ongoing mass atrocities. Uh, to pick up uh, the point that Navi Pillay uh, made uh, recently, uh, the human rights interface with peace and security I think is very well embedded now and the Secretary General of the United Nations has played uh, a very effective role in that embedding, including through his uh, very welcome initiative on human rights up front. Thinking about the challenges ahead and the current uh, challenges to protection, uh, we have to start with Syria. That is the biggest uh, protection issue uh, facing us, and it is where uh, more civilians continue to be killed and continue to be forced uh, to flee uh, their country. So we welcome uh, the agreement between the US and Russia on the cessation of hostilities, which the Security Council will be voting on uh, this afternoon. Uh, and it is absolutely crucial that the political negotiations can resume as soon as possible. We need, in short, to turn words into action and to ensure that there is a significant change of behavior by the Syrian regime and its backers so that civilians in Syria can uh, no longer uh, suffer from all of those indiscriminate attacks. Finally, in terms of what we can do, uh, we can try to improve early warning, we can try to turn that early warning into early action, and we can, all of us, I hope, sign up to the ACT code of conduct uh, that commits us never to vote against credible security action uh, to prevent and respond to mass atrocities. I'm very proud that the UK has not used our veto at all since 1989, and I'm very proud as a permanent member of the Security Council that we have uh, signed up to that uh, code of conduct. Uh, finally, I would just uh, encourage everyone to think about what practical action can we each take uh, to support uh, a united approach uh, when we do have early warning of impending conflicts and crises. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we give the floor to Romania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join the other distinguished speakers in thanking the PGA for convening this timely debate on the responsibility to protect and I also thank the panelists for their most comprehensive and enlightening presentations. Romania aligns itself with the statement delivered by the representative of the European Union, and I would like to add now some comments from a national perspective. Today we have this thematic discussion in the context of the first decade of the R2P, and it is indeed a reality that significant progress has been accomplished in the past years. At the same time, we are forced to admit that appalling war crimes are still committed in many parts of the world, not only by states, but increasingly but by non-state armed groups, which spread violent extremism and affect large groups of population, underpinning the international community's safety and security. Therefore, I believe we must win the campaign against extremism and firmly refuse to accept that violence and conflict are a kind of new normal. And in the face of the increasing number of mass atrocities taking place globally, we have to articulate our response, which must be based on a strong political will, and to calibrate it in order to include prevention as a key element to avoid war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. We also have to pay more attention to early warning signs and tackle the drivers of violent extremism. But nothing, nothing would do more in this respect than terminating conflicts which generate such crimes. In the last few years, we witnessed a very dangerous shift in conflict dynamics, which makes the R2P concept even more relevant. Several resolutions referencing R2P have been adopted by the UN Security Council and the Human Rights Council, but they did not prevent new mass atrocities. Therefore, it is high time now to further move from commitment to implementation, and I fully share the Deputy Secretary General Eliasson remark that R2P was not designed to be a comfortable rhetoric. Romania supports the code of conduct uh, proposed by the ACT group 
and of course the work of France and Mexico regarding the Security Council action to prevent or end mass atrocities. But we have also to keep in mind that decisions concerning the third pillar of the R2P are of the exclusive competence of the Security Council. At the same time, the implementation of the Agenda 2030 will offer solutions not only for preventing conflicts and crimes related to them, but also for healing broken societies and building a stable future for fragile and vulnerable communities. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I believe we need to strengthen the cooperation between New York and Geneva and to work more focused with the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, as they have also a valuable tool for prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I give the floor to the representative of Cuba. Gracias, señor facilitador. Quisiera, en primer lugar, decir que sobre el tema de responsabilidad de proteger, Cuba recientemente ha circulado un documento que todos pueden consultar eh, bajo la asignatura S barra 2016 barra 9. Eh, voy a hacer eh, lo más eh, rápida que pueda, pero en realidad me gustaría hacer alusión a varios elementos que mi país considera importantes. Eh, Cuba considera que el concepto de responsabilidad de proteger continúa ofreciendo serias dudas para muchos países, en particular para los pequeños estados en desarrollo debido a la falta de consensos y definiciones sobre varios elementos de este concepto que pueden ser fácilmente manipulados con fines políticos, como ya se ha dicho aquí por otros oradores. Es crucial que previo a la implementación del concepto de responsabilidad de proteger, la Asamblea llegue a un consenso sobre su alcance e implicaciones, que se resuelvan las diferencias de interpretación y que se garantice el reconocimiento y aceptación universal y conceda legitimidad a las acciones propuestas para su implementación. También ha sido un tema abordado por otros eh, oradores y creo que es un tema que los expertos deben analizar y que se debe tener en cuenta en cualquier acción futura que, que vaya a tener lugar en materia de responsabilidad de proteger. Quisiéramos apuntar también que el consenso internacional sobre el tema se circunscribe a los eh, reducidos y delicados, diría yo, límites de los párrafos 138 y 139 de la resolución 60 barra 1, que no voy a repetir eh, lo que dice, pero sí resulta a nuestro juicio, al juicio de Cuba, un error plantear que esta resolución o este documento adoptó el principio de responsabilidad de proteger. Nosotros no estamos de acuerdo con eso. Y es un criterio nuestro que tenemos derecho, por supuesto, a expresar. Esto es un concepto cuyas características, reglas de aplicación y mecanismos de evaluación están lejos de ser definidos y acordados. Eh, yo tengo varias, varios elementos por decir, cre veo que el micrófono me está sonando y le pido, por favor, eh, presidente, que me deje culminar la intervención. Eh, además de esto, quisiéramos, por supuesto, aclarar que para Cuba eh, los crímenes incluidos en los párrafos 138 y 139 son actos que todos los estados debemos prevenir, nosotros coincidimos con ese elemento, debemos reprimir, repudiar, y de hecho Cuba repudia todos estos crímenes. Si se cometen tanto en el en el contexto de los conflictos armados internos en países en desarrollo, como si se cometen, como ha ocurrido en el pasado cercano, por fuerzas de ocupación, fuerzas de orden público y expediciones militares en países desarrollados. Yo creo que esos son elementos también que tenemos que analizar. Es la relación... Esa relación de equilibrio que solo podría existir en un mundo menos selectivo y, por supuesto, con un proceso de, de democratización de nuestra organización. Por otro lado, quisiéramos acotar otros elementos que se pretenden ampliar eh, a partir de la declaración de la Cumbre Mundial del 2005. Creo que se ha pretendido ampliar el concepto y el ámbito de la responsabilidad de proteger y, además, usar términos que son jurídicamente ambiguos jurídicamente indefinidos y que no están incluidos en ningún en ningún tratado y en ninguna parte del derecho internacional, como hemos oído también a muchos oradores aquí usarlo, como es el caso de los términos de crímenes atroces, factores de riesgo, riesgos inminentes, atrocidades en masa, en qué documento está definido que es una atrocidad en masa o que es un crimen atroz. Eso jurídicamente y legalmente es ambiguo, es indefinido. Otra cuestión eh, de preocupación es la falta de definición y esto eh, valdría la pena. Could you eh, please conclude, uh, madam? Yo voy a concluir, yo voy a concluir. Valdría la pena preguntarle al panel eh, 
porque no existe falta de definición sobre quién decide y cuándo hay necesidad de proteger, quién determina que un Estado no protege a su población, quién y bajo qué criterios se determinan las formas de actuar y cómo evitar que el tema se utilice con fines intervencionistas. Todo esto no queda claro aún y no se ha realizado un debate sustantivo sobre el tema. Además, por último, quisiera decir que mi país... Eh, no apoya que se otorguen a, a órganos como el Consejo de Seguridad funciones que no le fueron atribuidas y que tampoco se puede apoyar una reinterpretación del concepto de seguridad colectiva refrendado en la Carta de la ONU. Eh, en aras del tiempo yo voy a concluir, pero el hecho de que eh, lograr de que la comunidad internacional, como se ha instado, no permanezca impasible ante este genocidio, crímenes de guerra, la depuración étnica y crímenes de lesa humanidad, que por supuesto repudiarlos y luchar contra eso es un esfuerzo, esfuerzo noble, eh, en muchos casos la responsabilidad de proteger ha escondido en la práctica, en su implementación, eh, esconde interés de contar con una herramienta más fácil para facilitar la injerencia de los asuntos internos de los, de los países y, por supuesto, subvertir el orden interno y llegar a una a intervención en su mayoría en los países en desarrollo. Habiendo dicho esto, yo quisiera, eh, permítame... I'm sorry, I have to cut you, madam. Agradecer al secretario... Please, you stop now. This is... You are exaggerating. Solo I'm iba sorry. a realizar, señor presidente, Please. unas palabras de agradecimiento al presidente de la Asamblea General y al secretario general por auspiciar este evento. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I don't think this is reasonable. I mean, we have made the rules very clear. I have been very, to some extent, even very lax. And uh, I do support most of what you have said, and I'm glad that you recognize that there is a need to look into the, uh, protecting people who are facing risk of uh, a serious crime like genocide, etc. And having said so, I mean, you put about the issue of intervention. I mean, can people s s pause some time and just look into the R2P and remember that the R2P is first and foremost about prevention? And that is why I refer it to the national architecture. Absolutely. And then second, there are states which are definitely willing to protect their population who are facing risk, but they don't have the capacity. And then the international community, that means you come to their rescue. And then when your leaders met here in 2005, they said on a case by case, they are the one who decided. I would not agree at that time to give such a power to the Secretary Council, but you decided and said on a case by case, the Secretary Council can decide to authorize the use of force. You know, so, and you have to bear with us that we do acknowledge, for instance, that the importance of social justice, the importance of uh, the respect of economic social rights, and this was contained in last year's Secretary General report on R2P. So, so I, I think it is time really that we try to be appease this debate and to de-dramatize this debate and to think more in terms of what can we do to protect those populations who are at risk. We have seen it in Syria. The Security Council has failed to protect the people of Syria. And recently, the Secretary General, when he was in the United Kingdom, he made it very clear when he said that the permanent members of the UN Security Council had a special responsibility to secure peace in intractable conflicts. So that's the, the Security Council. And those big powers, you know, who have to live up to their promise. That's not Cuba. You are not a big power. But you have, therefore, to be with those people who are at risk. I thank you, and I give the floor to the representative of Tanzania. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I think it's uh, important that we are having this discussion. Its tone is also welcome. It only suggests uh, its importance not only to the international community, but to the, go to the humanity we all, we all share. Uh, Mr. Moderator, the adoption of the 2005 outcome document and the recognition of the responsibility to protect was uh, an important landmark. 
and that uh, uh, therefore celebrating this 10th anniversary is therefore an invaluable moment for reflection and recommitment. I trust our panelists, especially Sir Gareth Evans, will vouch to the claim often made, oftentimes made, that R2P, R2P captures a simple and powerful idea that the primary responsibility to protect its own people from mass atrocity crimes lies primarily with the states. That the, the, the state, sovereignty, state sovereignty implies responsibility, not a license to kill. But when a state is unable or unwilling to prevent such atrocities, the wider international community has a collective responsibility to intervene. Yes, a simple and powerful idea. Nonetheless, let the truth be told. 10 years down, it turns out the simplest of ideas is not so simple. This is why we wish to make two observations. First, it is only right that we must continue to focus on the General Assembly as we seek to enhance national and global capabilities in combat combating impunity and the prevention of human rights violations. There are bound to be frustrations and disappointments, as clearly has been evidenced in this room. On the, manner, on the manner we proceed to implement R2P, it is also evident that the General Assembly has an important role in supporting states, states, states to strengthen their prevention capabil capabilities. Ironically, in many countries, including our own national institu institutions, such as in our case, the Commission for Human Rights and Good Governance, are less likely to obtain support from sources which only tend to work with non-governmental actors, which do not necessarily enjoy legitimacy of such national uh, agencies. That is not to say those non-governmental agencies do not have a role. They do, but you cannot over, uh, underplay the role of state agencies. The truth is, as a tool for prevention, education is vital in nurturing norms and practices for promoting good governance and the rule of law. Consequently, agencies with broader and wider national reach deserve support as a framework of, for instilling norms, values, and principles. Justice Pillay is right. We must focus on prevention of violations before they happen. It is pointless to adopt a host of declarations that recall, encourage, urge, reaffirm, etc., etc., but falls short of providing concrete and effective support for measures for strengthening national capabilities for prevention. There is no substitute for investing in education or prevention. Secondly, and finally, it is equally imperative that we must equally focus on the decision-making processes in the Security Council. In this regard, the working methods of the Council cannot escape scrutiny. To date, it remains difficult to find justification for, oh, oh, Justice, uh, Justice Pillay also pointed to the cynicism in Africa born of the selective application of R2P. To date, it remains difficult to find justification for the Council's decision to intervene in Libya in 2011 and is, is content with nothing less than regime change while remaining a spectator in situations where the moral imperative for action was equally beyond doubt. R2P must, only, must not only be a guiding principle about how sovereign governments should treat their people, it must also be about how international community ought to respond. Convenience and appropriateness should not be part of the equation. Our idealism should not cloud the failings taking place in the Council that inhibit the full realization of what is otherwise an ideal principle. And those in the Council who can make a difference should perhaps reduce the rhetoric and hypocrisy about R2P. Regrettably, the most depressing and, dis depressing and distressing reality of the past decade has been our collective failure to overcome limitations that are largely driven by political considerations. This is the reality we must confront and come to grips with. Never again must not be an empty rhetoric. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I thank the representative of Tanzania, and I give the floor to the representative of China. 
，中方欢迎联大举行此次专题辩论会，感谢联大主席吕克托夫特、联合国副秘书长艾利亚松和嘉宾的发言。二零零五年的世界首脑会议成果文件正式提出了保护的责任，将其适用范围严格限定于种族灭绝、种族清洗、战争罪和反人类罪。从今天讨论情况看，国际社会对保护的责任概念本身及如何加以落实仍有不同意见The concept itself and how to implement. 中方愿谈及以下几点看法：一是各国政府对保护本国公民负有首要责任，履行保护的责任不能违背尊重国家主权原则和不干涉内政的原则。无论国际形势如何变化，尊重各国的主权和不干涉内政等联合国宪章、宗旨和原则中的核心要素不能动摇。二是保护的责任只适用于只适用于种族灭绝等四种罪行，不应扩大或任意解释保护的责任，不应将其作为向他国施压的外交手段，更不能滥用甚至充当军事干涉一国内政的借口。三是举履行保护的责任无一定之规，各国应加大在预防和解防解决冲突方面的投入，重视在危机早期。通过谈判、对话等和平手段化解争端。国际社会应根据各国需要提供建设性帮助，形成预防外交的合力。徐大元先生，保护的责任迄今还停留在概念阶段，不构成一项国际法的规范。各方对该概念涉及的诸多问题仍有不同解释。对如何履行保护的责任仍有较大分歧。联大有必要根据2005年世界首脑会议成果文件和联大第六十三斜杠三零八号决议，继续就保护的责任进行探讨。在此过程中，应充分照顾全体会员国的舒适度和接受程度，以便形成普遍共识。谢谢协调员。I thank the representative of China, and I cannot but fully agree with you that R2P is not a norm of an international law. However, it is there to remind us that there are legal obligations we have contracted. I'm referring to the Geneva Convention. I'm referring to the International Chart of Human Rights. I mean, the whole series of human rights instruments, and so and. Hopefully, if those instruments which are legally binding were respected by member states, we might not need to use recourse to use the R2P. Thank you very much again for reminding us that dimension. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to invite the representative of Denmark. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. I have the pleasure of uh, delivering this statement on behalf of the Nordic countries. Uh, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and my own country, Denmark. First, let me thank uh, the President for the General Assembly for arranging this event to mark the 10th anniversary of the responsibility to protect at the UN. Thanks also to the Deputy Secretary and the distinguished panelists for their insightful comments and analysis. And indeed, thank you to you, Mr. Moderator. While I have difficulty seeing you here from my seat in the corner, I have listened uh, uh, with admiration to the way you have conducted uh, this meeting and provided for real interactive dialogue. Thank you very much for that. The Nordic countries very much agree that this is time to look ahead at the next decade of the responsibility to protect. The informal interactive dialogues that have been held since 2010 have been useful in terms of norm development. And in our view, it is now established that the membership agrees that the primary responsibility to protect populations from the R2P crimes lies with the state, and that the international community has the responsibility when the state ignores or is unable to fulfill its responsibility. We do, however, also recognize that views are differing, as we have heard today, on the aspects 
on of the RTOP concept in particular with regard to its implementation. And we recognize that further considerations consideration is needed on how to implement or operationalize the full spectrum of the concept, the three pillars of R2P. We know that prevention efforts save lives and that is more cost effective and panelists have already provided us with uh, ample insight as I said to this. Uh, so I would simply say that these elements, these uh, dimensions are important reasons why the Nordic countries support efforts towards a resolution in the General Assembly on the responsibility to protect as had been mentioned, uh, an, an important process was launched uh, uh, yesterday, championed by a group of countries uh, uh, of member states, including Denmark, uh, but a group from all regions of the membership. The Nordic countries encourage all member states to engage in the nego negotiations and join the efforts towards a consensus resolution that will reaffirm the commitment of our heads of states and governments in 20, uh, 2005 and will secure continued formal consideration of the, of the responsibility to protect in the UN. Finally, uh, a question, uh, because this is a Q&A, I understand, um, um, and, and, and just to, to the panel, uh, we will be very interested to hear your thoughts. We have many lessons on the peace architecture, and we're looking into that at the moment also, so perhaps some thoughts on the operational interplay, both in New York and at the national level, or the synergies between the implementation of respons responsibility to, pr to protect and other similar concepts, for instance, uh, protection of civilians, early warning, atrocity prevention, international criminal justice, and maybe also on how to situate these efforts within goal 16 of the uh, 2030 agenda. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much, and now I give the floor to the uh, representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, well, I think I'd like to start by saying that um, it is a difficult time for civilians caught in situations of conflict, and I believe that they are much worse off today than they were 10 years ago. This should be the very sobering starting point. Uh, the record of the past 10 years is not an encouraging one. And I think that the debate today, which was not a monologue, by the way, and that's welcome in itself, uh, it raises moral issues and practical issues. Um, there is a moral dilemma here in the way we envisage the third pillar in particular. And uh, Libya is the obvious example and the issue that cannot be swept under the carpet. Um, and why is this so? Because a high moral standard was raised in defense of military intervention to protect civilians, but this intervention has actually made the situation of civilians much worse than it was before. So the do no harm precept was not observed in Libya. And there is something of a questionable morality about this, which we must address as we go forward. Otherwise, we will not be able to go forward. The other point is that we talk a lot about prevention, but there are very simple ways of um, this demonstrating our commitment to prevention uh, that are not taking place at this very moment. I think a very good place to start with prevention would be to concentrate on Israel-Palestine. And I was surprised not to hear the word Palestine by any of the uh, panelists this morning. This would go a long way to helping prevent violent extremism that conduces to terrorism and other tensions in the Middle East and the Arab world, broadly speaking. Another modest contribution to prevention would be to contribute to the Peace Building Fund, for example. And we are very struck in the discussions on the peace building architecture to see the level of resistance to um, an assessed contributions fund of even very modest pr proportions uh, in that context. So um, I find that you know, um, those who express some skepticism with respect to the original design of R2P should not be dismissed as enemies of uh, uh, the protection of civilians. I think there's a debate here about preserving the highest possible moral standard for UN uh, action and strategies at a time when civilians seem to be specially under stress. And I would also argue um, that those fleeing conflict, and they are indirectly fleeing the threat of the R2P crimes, should also be protected and treated with humanity. So that it would be inconsistent to um, assume or to uphold 
a collective responsibility to protect civilians when they are in their own country threatened by these crimes, but to turn their backs on these refugees and migrants when they knock on your door. So the debate is quite wide. It has become more complex, and I'm actually pleased that we are having a dialogue and not a monologue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And now I give the floor to the uh, representative of Armenia. Well, thank you very much, uh, moderator. And uh, given the strict time limitations, uh, uh, I would start with a generic big uh, appreciation and thank you uh, and Jennifer Wells and the panelists uh, for the excellent initiative and, 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 and the very interesting debate and the dialogue, as I very much agree with our Brazilian colleague. Uh, Within this time limit, I would, uh, and, and of course, this this appreciation comes from a country which has been uh, uh, which has been quite uh, uh, engaging uh, over many years and, and active in promoting the concepts of prevention, uh, the prevention and, and and protection and and punishment of, of atrocity crimes, genocide, and all other atrocity crimes. Uh, my focus would, within this time limit would be on the culture of prevention, and I, I, I wanted to uh, reflect on, on, on uh, the points made by uh, um, Madam Pillai. Uh, she brought up this example of uh, the hate speech being cultivated over years in one case, which then resulted in uh, an atrocity crime. The capacity of the international community to respond to that the responsibility, that is, a, that is one way of reflecting on responsibility to protect. The capacity of the international co uh, community to react to that, to identify and to see, and, and this is a situation that we, we, can, we can identify around us in our uh, you know, live stream, news streams of the day. To what extent are we capable to see various situations through the prism of the risks of atrocity crimes that are happening, that are abundant around us. So it is very much about the capacity to develop the culture of prevention. There are many norms uh, and of course uh, the legal obligations in pr protection of human rights, in, in the international uh, humanitarian law obligations and all others, many other instruments, one of them which we consistently uh, commend uh, that was developed by the special advisor, the, the, the framework analysis, are those many instruments uh, and, and norms that are available to us. It is very much also about the culture, the capacity, not least, of course, if not first of all, within the United Nations. The other point I wanted to react to is, of is the point on uh, the scope of responsibility, from state responsibility to individual responsibility. And that is also, that, that, that was a point made by Ms. Luce, and, and this is again a point uh, on the scope of responsibility to protect and it is also again the culture the capacity to cultivate such culture of seeing through events uh, which might be uh, you know um, which might result in such in such atrocities uh, we might want to think also to what extent such debates or the legalistic debates about various situations matter to those who are going through such situations matter to Yazidis for example in the Middle East today this is, again, I'm, I'm, I would, I've started with that. I would want to, uh, uh, to end also again with the uh, point on the culture of prevention. Thank you. Thank the Ambassador of Armenia, and I give the floor to the representative of Ghana to be followed by Australia. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Now, I wish to express my thanks to the President of the General Assembly for convening this thematic panel discussion. The panelists have provided us very useful insights into the important concept of the responsibility to protect. 10 years after the endorsement of all member states of the World Summit Outcome document, it is important to review and assess how the principle has been operationalized and work towards addressing challenges and broader acceptance within the international community. There is no denying in the face, that in the face of the growing conflict and crisis in our world today, the R2P remains relevant, both as an expression of political commitment and as a framework for action to prevent and end genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. All of our panelists have underscored the importance of the principle in, of observing the three equal and mutually reinforcing pillars of the R2P. 
we share the view that a consistent and balanced implementation of the principle through the three-tier pillar framework, fully respecting the principles of the United Nations Charter and the international law, would help gain wider acceptance of the R2P, paying due attention to the national and regional early warning systems, capabilities, and responses. In general, preventive action in the approach to R2P is pivotal to the success of the principle. The 10th anniversary is an opportune moment to take the next steps forward and to building on Articles 138 and 139 of the World Summit Outcome document. We share the view that continuing the consideration of the challenges as well as successes and priorities is important and this has been well elaborated and spelled out clearly by our distinguished panelists. We would like to stress the necessity of widening the network of national focal points and strengthening national capacities for prevention, that these will be critical to upholding the responsibility to protect. The work of the special advisors on the prevention of genocide and responsibility to protect will be pivotal and must be supported with necessary resources. Finally, Mr. President, Ghana as a member of the cross-regional group that initiated the zero text of the resolution to commemorate the 10th anniversary of R2P remains committed to an open, transparent, and inclusive process of consultations with all member states that would enable us to arrive at a consensual approach to the R2P and all the issues that must be addressed in terms of implementation. It is our hope that the next decade will witness closer engagement and progress for the sake of humanity. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I thank the representative of Ghana and I give the floor to Australia to be followed by Philippines. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And um, let me begin also by thanking the PGA for organizing this uh, very valuable and um, very lively uh, debate. And could I especially thank all of our panelists for their very, very thoughtful and uh, forward-looking interventions. Um, you only need to take a very quick look at events around the globe uh, to realize that R2P is needed more than ever. I think that fundamental point is well accepted. Um, and as the panelists have done, we see this 10th anniversary as an opportunity not just to take stock, of, uh, of where we've, um, of how we've gone on R2P, but very importantly, to look forward on how we can further the implementation of R2P in light of the experience to date. Um, one initiative, and it's pleasing to see that it's been mentioned by a number of the panelists, but also a number of the speakers here today, is the initiative for a General Assembly resolution. Um, this would be the first substantive resolution of the GA in the 10 years of R2P's existence, and importantly, also put R2P firmly on the General Assembly's agenda going forward. Um, others have mentioned how important this GA role is in the foundational document that all of our heads of state and government uh, adopted. It envisaged a leading role for the General Assembly in the UN on R2P. Um, the, our Slovenian permanent representative mentioned that a zero draft has been put together by a, a, a very representative, a broad cross-regional group and presented to the membership uh, just yesterday. Um, we, we fully recognize that there are different perspectives on R2P and that's been evident uh, in this room today. Uh, one of the rationales for the resolution that we have put forward is precisely so that those views can be shared and common ground identified. And we therefore look forward to constructive engagement in the coming weeks in the negotiations process. Um, we are committed, as my Ghanaian colleague just mentioned, to an open, transparent, inclusive process and to consensus adoption of this resolution. And if I could finally just reiterate Australia's support for the ACT and the French-Mexican initiatives on um, restraint on the use of the veto, also to the important global network of R2P focal points. They're all important initiatives and we encourage support for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor now to Philippines. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I asked for the floor to share with the meeting today briefly the outcome of the second international meeting of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, or GAMAC, which the Philippines and Switzerland co-hosted in Manila last February 2 to 4. The meeting focused on how to strengthen national architectures in the prevention of mass atrocity crimes. Your good self, um, Mr. Special Advisor, joined more than 200 delegates and experts to share their experiences and to contribute in an inclusive multi-stakeholder involvement in preventing atrocity crimes and in strengthening the capacities and strategies of states, international bodies, and non-governmental organizations to deter such crimes. Regional plans of action on practical tools and approaches to combat the threat of mass atrocity crimes were also discussed at GAMAC 2. The GAMAC, uh, GAMAC 2 also specifically discussed the importance of atrocity prevention education curricula in promoting a culture of tolerance and accountability, developing early warning mechanisms, compiling good practices on countering hate speech and promoting inclusivity, inclusivity and making information and technology tools, including the use of social media, available for atrocity prevention at the local community and grassroots level. The participants at GAMAC too agreed that GAMAC has great potential to raise awareness, support policy formulation, and strengthen capacities. Details on the outcome of GAMAC too are posted on the GAMAC website. Mr. Chair, while it is true that atrocity crimes continue to occur in some parts of the world, it is also true that the determined will and efforts of the global community to prevent and end mass atrocity crimes are even more remarkable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the representative of the Philippines, and I use this uh, opportunity to thank her also for the successful uh, outcome of the GAMAC 2. And I do invite you really to visit the website. I, I think this was really a great uh, opportunity for the 70 member states who are around to really put emphasis on prevention and to try to share experiences on building national architectures for prevention. And now I give the floor to Switzerland, which also co, uh, I would say, hosted that important event. Monsieur le Moderateur, la Suisse se joint au discours du groupe d'amis de la responsabilité de protéger et souhaite ajouter les éléments suivants en sa capacité nationale. Premièrement, ma délégation salue le travail du bureau du conseiller spécial pour la prévention du génocide et de la conseillère spéciale pour la responsabilité de protéger. Nous saluons également la création d'un groupe d'amis de la responsabilité de protéger à Genève qui permettra notamment de renforcer les synergies entre New York et Genève. Monsieur le modérateur, durant les dix années qui ont suivi le sommet du millénaire, la communauté internationale a reconnu l'importance cruciale de la protection. Cependant, la persistance des atrocités montre qu'il reste des défis majeurs à relever. Trop souvent, c'est l'impunité qui règne, encourageant la commission de futures violations. Il convient de rappeler que lorsque les États n'ont pas la volonté ou la capacité de poursuivre les auteurs de crimes internationaux, la Cour pénale internationale peut jouer un rôle clé. Monsieur le modérateur, Nous soutenons les divers efforts, notamment l'initiative transrégionale, de présenter un projet de résolution sur la responsabilité de protéger. L'institutionnalisation du dialogue dans le domaine de la responsabilité de protéger au sein de l'Assemblée générale permettra de mener une discussion bénéfique sur cette thématique. Monsieur le modérateur, dans ce contexte où l'actualité pourrait nous faire douter sur l'engagement des États pour prévenir les atrocités, Le succès de la récente réunion du Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes à Mani nous donne espoir. Comme l'a mentionné la représentante des Philippines, ce deuxième rendez-vous international, soutenu par la Suisse, a réuni 52 États afin de réfléchir et générer des initiatives concrètes pour le renforcement des architectures nationales de prévention des atrocités. Cela nous a confortés dans l'idée qu'une communauté d'États associés à la société civile, 
est activement mobilisé pour apporter des réponses innovantes dans le respect de la souveraineté. Nous invitons tous les États membres à s'y associer. En conclusion, Monsieur le modérateur, nous souhaitons rappeler l'existence du code de conduite sur l'usage du droit de veto en cas de crime de génocide, de crime de guerre ou contre l'humanité élaboré par le groupe ACT. Le code est actuellement soutenu par 110 États membres et nous, nous y invitons tous les États à y souscrire. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Je vous remercie et je donne la parole au représentant de International Coalition for Responsibility to Protect. If not, I give the floor to... Uh, okay. Who is it? Is it on now? Sorry, I think it's... Uh, there was some confusion up here in the balcony about uh, which microphone uh, that was going to. My apologies, Mr. Moderator, and uh, greetings from the balcony. Uh, I thank you for uh, this important thematic panel discussion marking the 10th anniversary of R2P. I have a longer statement prepared which will be circulated online, but as requested, I'll make my comments brief and interactive. First, let me uh, take this opportunity to support the calls made by the panelists and delegations regarding the need for a strong, balanced, and forward-looking resolution on R2P in the General Assembly. Secondly, in the 10 years since the UN World Summit, the Global Centre has been privileged to work in partnership with the UN, its member states, and civil society in advancing R2P. In response to earlier comments, I'd say we all know that the Security Council and the members of this General Assembly have struggled to consistently and comprehensively uphold R2P in all circumstances. We know where the international community has fallen short, in Sh Syria, in Sri Lanka, in Darfur, and other places. But we should also remind ourselves that there are people alive today in the Central African Republic, in South Sudan, and elsewhere because of the responsibility to protect. Ten years after the UN World Summit, our goal remains the same, to ensure that all human beings, regardless of gender, religion, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or political affiliation, and regardless of where they live, do not have to go to bed at night fearing the arrival of the death squad, militia, or genocidier. R2P has already changed the way that we view and respond to atrocities. But at a time when 60 million human beings are displaced by war and conflict, and the entire edifice of the international humanitarian and human rights law appears to be under attack, this assembly should reaffirm its belief in our collective responsibility to protect from crimes which diminish and dishonor us all as human beings. And in this regard, I would like to finally pose a question to the panelists. Moving into the next decade of the responsibility to protect, how do we ensure that R2P and the prevention of mass atrocity crimes remain a core priority of the UN system and of the next Secretary General? I thank you, Mr. Moderator. Oh, thank you. Hi. My name is uh, William Pace. Uh, my organization is a founding steering committee member of the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect. Our global NGO network spans all UN regions. In our written statement, we recognize the importance uh, and the major achievements of the first 10 years, but focus also on the challenges we face in the next decade. The International Coalition for Responsibility to Protect calls for the deepening of cooperation with civil society. Civil society actors are often the first to witness the indicators of the crimes in their commission and thus are frequently primary preventers of and responders to these crimes. Our statement calls for the whole of government approach to implementation and supports the further building of national architectures for atrocity uh, prevention. In advancing the mainstreaming of responsibility to protect, we encourage the integration of R2P goals in sustainable development, in disarmament, in the implementation of the responsibility to protect and the women, peace, and security agendas. 
Mr. President, as many have noted today, even in the few expressing disagreement, our statement also recognizes the failures of the Security Council, the mistakes of the major powers, and we reiterate our support for the Code of Conduct regarding the Security Council action against genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes, as well as the France and Mexico political declaration on the veto. We would conclude expressing our strong support for the draft General Assembly resolution on responsibility to protect, and which includes uh, uh, providing that the R2P would be on the General Assembly's agenda. Uh, the two quick questions for the panelists. Should not there be a clear distinction, for example, in the Libya and Syria situations, a distinction between the failure of the Security Council in how the Council and member states implement and monitor Chapter 7 actions and the normative basis R2P provides for Chapter 7 resolutions? And, and related to this, is not the paralysis of the Security Council and the Council's international and the international community's failure to implement Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 responsibilities of the Charter, including implementing responsibility to protect, is not the paralysis a primary justification to include responsibility to protect on the regular agenda of the General Assembly? Thank you. I thank uh, the representative of the civil society. And now, uh, before we adjourn, I will give for the remaining uh, 10 minutes the floor to the panelists to respond to some few of the questions which have been raised, bearing in mind that uh, this afternoon we will resume the discussion uh, at, from 3 o'clock in the ECOSOC chamber. Uh, so uh, please uh, just bear in mind that you'll have opportunity to respond to also the, all the questions which have been raised this morning, but just to uh, give some glimpse. Can start, yeah. If I could just respond generally to some of the things I've heard in the debate, inevitably there are sensitivities always in a debate like this. No one likes to be specifically mentioned in a debate like this, even it seems when the mention is basically favourable, um, as mine was in relation to Kyrgyzstan, that in the context of a very difficult, explosive situation, um, the state had cooperated uh, very well with the international community to ensure an effective prevention exercise. But I don't think, despite those sensitivities that we have heard and the questions that have been raised, we should exaggerate the extent of the differences that we've heard around this chamber today. I didn't hear anyone saying that the four crimes in 2005's resolution should not be crimes. There's argument about how they should be characterised, whether it's appropriate to generalise them as atrocity crimes or not, but nobody seems to be suggesting they should not be crimes. And of course there are consequences internationally if they are crimes and those rules are violated in practice. I didn't hear anyone saying that it should not be a state's responsibility to protect its own citizens from these crimes, pillar one. I didn't, anyone, I didn't hear anyone saying that um, there should be no assistance to states who want that assistance to deal with difficult situations internally that they feel is beyond their capacity, pillar two. I didn't hear anyone saying that there should not be a huge focus on preventive effort, that prevention is always infinitely preferable to any form of reaction to fires once they've broken out. I didn't hear anyone not Cuba, not Russia, no one. I heard no one expressing any comfort at all with the terrible situation in Syria that we now find ourselves in with no obvious and immediate way out. The only concerns that I've heard, as I've heard on many previous debates, are that intervention, the third pillar, if you like, coercive measures may be misused. There's a possibility of them being misused in a way that would be offensive to time-honoured principles of sovereignty, which we all share. There is a concern that there may be the possibility of politics intruding and these measures being used to pursue political objectives that are not immediately related to civilian protection. Let me go back to the original debate we had on the Commission that came up with the concept of responsibility to protect. It was an absolutely huge part of that debate and stopped us getting internal consensus for a long time as to whether or not 
if you were to go down the path of the most extreme form of coercion, military action, there would have to be Security Council endorsement of that. There was a strong feeling in my commission, which is still here to this day, that in these extreme situations, um, you should not require necessarily um, a Security Council endorsement, that it ought to be possible for a coalition of the, feeling, of the willing to take whatever action is necessary. That was absolutely rejected by my commission. We had a long internal, difficult debate about it, but the overwhelming feeling was that the rule of law had to prevail, that the, you know, there could be no exceptions to that in terms of basic principle, that if you were going to take that most extreme form of intervention, it had to be with Security Council approval, that the, you couldn't invent a rule of customary international law to make this possible. The law was clear, the sovereignty principles were clear, they couldn't be, they couldn't be cut across in that way. And that was, of course, reflected in our report and reflected very specifically in the language of 2005. And what's not to like about that language? Of course, this then places a huge responsibility on the Security Council itself both to react in an affirmative way uh, that is helpful uh, in dealing with these atrocity crime situations and doesn't drag its heels and doesn't lose sight of the catastrophic human consequences of not effectively acting, that doesn't take us back to the bad old days of Cambodia and Rwanda and Srebrenica. Of course, there's that kind of responsibility, but there's also a responsibility on the Security Council not to go too far in the other direction. And of course, this is the position we find ourselves in at the moment. The Security Council being deeply unwilling to do perhaps some of the things that need to be done because of the internal lack of consensus, the debate, the rather vitriolic debate that has been taking place ever since 2011 about how the Syrian situation was handled. I think in the early stages of the, 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 sorry, the Libyan case was handled. I think in the early days of Libya, when there was a consensus on the Security Council, the Security Council acted exactly in accordance with the principles of R2P. It laid down the markers, behaviour which was intolerable, unacceptable, and said that they must not be exceeded. And when they were exceeded, then the authorisation was given for appropriate coercive action. What, of course, happened thereafter was the Security Council then lost its way. Perhaps political considerations did intrude. Perhaps other considerations other than pure civilian protection came into play. And for whatever reason, the security, the, the, the interveners went on a path of, of regime uh, change which was seen as a bridge too far by the other members. The other members, in turn, themselves reacted and, indeed, I think, overreacted in the sense that when the first um, Syrian debate came up, the opportunity was there for condemnatory resolution and those early stage measures of the kind that were used against uh, the Libyan regime, which if they had been applied in the early stages against what was happening, the one-sided violence in Syria, maybe a strong and clear enough message would have been sent for the, for the situation not to deteriorate as it did. The short point is that what happened happened, there was an overreach on both sides, and what we all now have to do is to take a deep breath, step back, and try to find common ground again on how to cope with these hardest of cases. It's not a matter of saying there can never under any circumstances be that extreme form of intervention. We know that there are going to be unhappily Rwanda-type situations when that may just be unavoidable. But we sure as hell want any such intervention to be properly conducted within the rules of international law under the auspices of the Security Council, with the Security Council behaving in a responsible way and subjecting itself to an internal monitoring and review process to ensure that consensus is maintained for the lifetime of such a mandate. Thank you so very much. So these are the issues that remain to be fixed, but if we yeah. don't fix them, we're going to sacrifice our common humanity and we have to keep our eyes Thanks, on the Thanks, Garnet. You'll have an opportunity this afternoon to come back again to these questions. Navi Pile. Um, I think there's been a, such a rich discussion pointing to serious areas of concern which is the aspect of politicization, uh, political motives, and selectivity 
in uh, intervention. So I agree with some of the suggestions then that we have to have a proper code of conduct in respect of intervention and follow up by the Security Council, not just pass a resolution, but follow up on the implementation. I take very seriously the uh, criticism raised by the representative of Brazil that none of us mentioned Palestine. So here's a glaring situation of very serious human rights violations, um, hugely threatening to the whole of the Middle East. Year in and year out, the, uh, at the request of the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, the Office of the High Commissioner and uh, commissions of inquiry submit reports on various violations here uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories, and yet there is no action taken. It's a major complaint on the part of victims all over the world that there is too much talk at the United Nations and, and less action. Um, I think then that reinforcing R2P is just one of the routes that we want to take together with the uh, act to uh, reinforce the principles once again and reduce the uh, politicization of, of intervention and protection. And I will have more to say this afternoon. Thank you. Snavi, Ed. Thank you. Let me touch on a couple of topics very briefly. Uh, one, I remember very well the first debates we had in, in 2009. Uh, things have narrowed, the differences have narrowed a great deal, and this is a far um, more focused debate. I just want to respond to a couple of things. Uh, the question was raised about Burundi, um, and I don't have the answer for Burundi, but I do think this slogan that I've heard several times today, that you go from early warning to early action, is skipping a step. And that's a sober assessment of what kind of situation one is facing and what the consequences could be of one kind of action or another. In some ways, that's a responsibility before protecting, uh, which maybe was not uh, considered as much as it should have been in the case of uh, Libya. Uh, second of all, on Kyrgyzstan, uh, I did participate in those days uh, in terms of the UN's involvement in that situation. Uh, we thought it was very much to assist the government in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, there was coordination between the UN and the OSCE uh, in terms of what sort of response was appropriate. It looked to us like ethnic cleansing had occurred, not by the government. Yes, it was by sectarian groups. But one of the big innovations in the 2009 report, which had not been in the outcome document in 2005, was to say that non-state actors have to be held accountable. Uh, the responsibility lies with them if they control territory. And that, in fact, uh, governments don't always control their whole territory. Uh, and so there is an international uh, requirement to try to be of assistance in those areas. And unfortunately, we've seen more and more of these kinds of crimes by non-state armed groups. Uh, on Libya, there were some efforts at prevention. I recall those well, uh, but they didn't get very far. Maybe they should have been given more time. Uh, but again, it wasn't really the problem of the response. The problem was that they hadn't thought about the consequences afterwards and the commitment, long-term commitment, uh, to putting uh, Libyan a society back together wasn't given the attention that it should have. Uh, there have been a number of comments about the relationship between R2P and international law. Uh, I agree with those who say that R2P is not a legal norm uh, in the UN sense, and I don't think it was intended to be. But we did have lots of legal norms, and we still do, uh, in this area of human rights and humanitarian law that don't have any systematic mechanisms or frameworks or strategies uh, for compliance and implementation. We've had a genocide convention for almost 70 years until R2P came along, uh, and even for the UN, there was no really systematic way of approaching it and thinking about these things. So the purpose of R2P is not to reinvent international law, it's to assist international law, uh, and that is exactly what we need. To the question from Simon Adams about how to keep R2P relevant, I would very much agree with those who have emphasized 
the next Secretary General, whoever she or perhaps he might be, uh, should be asked questions about this in these hearings that are coming up very soon. A very important innovation that the PGA has worked out with the Security Council. Uh, these are very important questions to them respond. And unfortunately, as I think some people have noted, R2P is going to remain very, very relevant because unfortunately atrocity crimes are not going away. And the plight of uh, now tens of millions of vulnerable people who have been forcibly displaced uh, are going to keep R2P as a way of thinking about and framing these crises and how to approach these crises uh, all too relevant, unfortunately. Thank you. Finally, Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for your excellent comments, member states, uh, this morning. There's been a lot of rich things put on the table. Let me just uh, try and attack a few questions before we break. First of all, the question about how we strengthen resilience to these four acts specified in the summit outcome document. I think we've seen through discussions in this chamber, also learning among member states and through the research we've done for the annual reports, uh, a beginning of a roadmap for how to do that that can inform very practically the efforts of states and other actors. Secondly, about how to strengthen uh, sister concepts like protection of civilians, I think one of the value adds of the responsibility to protect is that it has, as our Armenian uh, colleague suggested, put a particular spotlight on the protection of populations from particular acts. So while you might have other perspectives at the table emphasizing political processes uh, or military processes, the focus on victims and how they are threatened and how those threats may change over time has been something that the responsibility to protect has brought into the conversation. And it's changed how we think about protection of civilians in the context of peacekeeping. The excellent question about Burundi. Um, yes, it remains a situation of concern, but I think to echo something that Gareth Evans said, I think 25 years ago we would have been approaching this situation very differently. Um, we have had very concerted efforts on the part of a variety of actors to respond to what are risk factors. Uh, we have had actors describe what they're doing uh, as an attempt to prevent the escalation towards atrocity crimes. Um, are we out of a, a situation of crisis? Not necessarily, but it's being approached within that framework by many actors. Uh, and those efforts need to be supported, and many of those efforts are, are regional ones. On Libya, I want to come back and stress that contrary to what was said by the Russian representative, um, Libya has been a subject of discussion between the Secretariat and member states for four years now. Um, we have had many consultations. It's been mentioned and discussed and analyzed in two Secretary General's reports, and it was mentioned by members of the panel this morning. And we take very seriously the concerns around that and continue to. And on the question that Cuba asked, the very central question about who decides in the situations uh, of the third pillar when there may be a crisis of protection and the international community responds. The answer to that question, and that question's been asked many times of me and similar panels, is that you, the member states, declared in 2005 that who you want to decide is the Security Council. Now, I would submit provocatively, some of you don't like that answer. Um, and that's why you keep asking the question. But that is the answer. It's the Security Council. Uh, and so we need to think about the implications of that and how to improve upon those processes. But I thank you for raising the question again, uh, because it gives us an opportunity to debate it here. Thank you. I thank all of you. Uh, and uh, I thank particularly the uh, interpreters who have uh, voluntarily and uh, spontaneously decided to go beyond the time. And I uh, invite you uh, to the ECOSOC room the, uh, at uh, 3 o'clock sharp so that we will continue uh, the discussion. We have more than 20 member states still remaining and some UN agencies as well. Bon appétit à tous.